special looks good. Traveling up. Water towers can fly! Yeah. Ego down phenomenal. Water down phenomenal. Bring it, let's see, dog. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Somebody tell me these audio is working. Give me a 5x5 five five in chat. It is time for another Virtual Astronomy Live in partnership with the Intrepid Museum. Uh, I am going to see... Okay, whew, chat's over here on this screen, and it looks like y'all can see, see and hear me right now. John Galloway here. Some of you may know me as Das. But this is a show that we're looking to do on a more regular basis. You might have caught the little test we did last month when we did the uh, test gig, I guess. This is something that I've been doing for almost two years now over on my Twitch channel in partnership with Intre Intrepid Museum. It's the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum up in New York City. It's an aircraft carrier in a river with a space shuttle on top of it in all sorts of aerospace, plane, artifacts, historical, World War II, across the board, cool things at the museum. So long Long ago and far away, I actually would travel to the museum. The audio is still working, right? Whew, okay, good. Um, I would actually travel to the museum, and I would do these shows in person. I would pack up my streaming rig, and I would go, and I would set up a tripod with a camera and a little headset, and they would have these events once a month that they called Virtual Astronomy Live. They'd have a guest speaker up on the stage. You'd sort of file in and sit down in your chairs, and you're underneath the space shuttle Enterprise, and you're on the deck of the aircraft carrier, and the speaker would talk about a cool science topic. Right. And so things happen. State of the world lately with the pandemic and all sort of and all that sort of thing. The in-person shows got spooled back, spooled back, got shut down for a while, honestly. And we said those shows were really cool. How could we keep them going? And so long ago, almost two years ago, we pivoted those shows to virtual events, which is what we're doing now. So now with the Virtual Astronomy Live, we're doing the exact same thing. We're going to have a special guest. Today's special guest is actually going to be the NASA Ingenuity, that Mars helicopter, the team lead, the guy who flies the hel I, I make like RC joystick things, right? It's not like an RC joystick, but uh, one of the people who flies the helicopter on Mars, the team lead for the team that flies the helicopter on Mars, and we're going to hang out with them for an hour and a half doing a live chat and Q&A. So that's the virtual event. Now, there's very little astronomy actually in these events. So that's uh, something that was confusing some people sometimes. We're not going to be looking at stars or anything like that. Today, we're going to be looking at the flight paths and imagery, talking with the helicopter team lead for the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. That's what we're doing. No astronomy, though. Well, there are stars in the background. There's like a Hubble background, but that's as many stars as you get. So I do have today a little bit of a pre-show as well. I've got a special guest with me. Not even not a special guest with me. I have actually Elicia Siegel, who is with the Intrepid Museum, and she's going to do a little bit of a pre-show here talking about, well, I don't know, Alicia, what are you going to talk about? Actually, funny enough, I'm going to be talking a little about astronomy. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm going to be talking a bit about Mars and how it's become such a cultural phenomenon for us to lead us into what the Ingenuity helicopter is showing us how, on Mars. So how, there's your astronomy. Perfect timing. I don't understand. How can you do that to me? I'm like, there's no real astronomy in the virtual astronomy live, and then you're just going to do... Well, I don't want to let the fans down. You know, <laughs> if somebody came hoping for astronomy, we are here to bring it tonight. <laughs> Excellent. Alicia does all sorts of cool stuff with the museum. Um, I think two years ago you hadn't done a lot of streaming, and over the last two years you are quite at home behind a virtual event like this, aren't you? That's true, yeah. So hi everyone. If you uh, aren't familiar with my face, I guess already. Um, my name is Alicia Siegel. I do a lot of the Intrepid Museum's educational public programming, both online on our streaming channels and in person. Uh, I'm also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, spreading excitement about our incredible space missions as well. Uh, but yeah, these pre-shows, you know, they're all about kind of warming us up for the main event tonight um, with something fun or educational about the topic or somewhat relevant, um, or to also fill you in on some cool stuff happening at the museum too. So we do teach to a lot of themes about sea, air, and space yep. at the museum. And if you do get the chance to come visit us on site, you'll get to see some really super cool pieces of space history, just like this thing behind me here. We it's... got the glorious space shuttle enterprise. Yeah. You can walk um, there but... actually. Like what the, the background there is actually taken from a platform and you can walk right up and like look at the nose of the space shuttle like this right in front of you, right? Oh. That's yeah. Right. That's no right. booping, though. There's a glass. There's like a plexiglass thing. No booping. No booping. Not allowed. Um, but, you know, a lot of people 
um, wonder, you know, why is this World War II era aircraft carrier? Why are you also a space museum, right? And it's because Intrepid served as a prime recovery vessel for two early NASA missions in the 1960s during the Mercury and the Gemini program. So we love to embrace our historical connection to space. And we are also just obviously so thrilled to be hosting these programs with you guys every month as well. Yep, absolutely. And so really quickly, you can get more information about the Intrepid Museum at intrepidmuseum.org. The mods on whichever channel this is on. It's on like 15 channels today. I don't even know where all it's going. I should, but I don't. Um, click on the link in chat, intrepidmuseum.org. You can get more in, more information, not only about virtual programs that you can join with the museum, but also if you're in New York City, how you can visit in person. Right, Alicia? That's right. And actually, at the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some really exciting stuff that we have coming up. Excellent. Um, but I don't want to give too much away just yet. Okay. Um, tonight's virtual astronomy live, though, is, as Das mentioned, all about the one year anniversary of the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter landing on Mars. What I like to call the landiversary, you could say. The, the big seriously? day. I know you're welcome. That's another thing, guys, if you don't already know, I'm a big pun user. Um, <laughs> but so the I'm, big day is tomorrow. I'm a head out. <laughs> By the way, so happy landiversary, perseverance, and ingenuity. <laughs> uh, but later on, as he said, you're going to hear from NASA's Mars helicopter team lead, T Teddy Zanettos. Um, he's the guy in charge of ingenuity. I'll do this too. And he's going to fill you in on some of the amazing things that they've got going on up there. Uh, maybe even a little teaser about, I don't know, helicopters of the future up there too. But before we head into that, it's pre-show time. So it is pre I want to talk tonight a little bit about just to look back at Mars as a cultural phenomenon in general and how it has actually become so much a part of our lives, whether we realized it or not. Should I click so, go? Like, is it time to go? Yeah. So let's dive right in, shall we? All right. Here we go. Alicia, take it away. All right. So, yeah. Why Mars, right? Mankind has been fascinated by Mars for generations, spawning all these stories and, and a mindset that we actually still embrace today. And as you probably know, a lot of the origins stem from its red color. It's like that glowing red eye in the sky. It's very angry, uh, which we now know is due to its dusty red surface covered by iron oxide. But in Babylonian astronomy, the planet was actually named after Nurgle, their deity of fire and war and destruction. In Hinduism, you can see here it was named after Mongol, a force of strength and violence, anger, also, though, has red skin. In Chinese and Arabian mythology, Mars was represented by a fiery star. And to the ancient Romans, which is what most of Western culture has adopted when it comes to planets, Mars was the god of war. So it's often represented symbolically as a circle with a small arrow pointing out of it, which is believed to actually be a stylized representation of a shield and a spear used by Mars in battle. That symbol now, though, is also associated with other things like the male gender, as well as in alchemy, actually, to symbolize the element iron, which is very fitting for Mars's surface. But did you know it's even been baked into our weekly activities? Did you know Mars has an official day? It's Tuesday. 5,000 years ago, the ancient Babylonians first created what we now know of as the week, dividing it into seven days. And each day was named for one of the seven known at the time celestial bodies, sun, moon, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mars Day was Tuesday. And this actually spans across many cultures and it's baked right into the Latin root and Romance languages. The word for Tuesday in Italian is martedi. In Spanish, it's martes. And in French, it's mardi, M-A-R-D-I. Uh, and this is also what Americans pronounce as Mardi Gras, which means Fat Tuesday, which we just celebrated. And it stems from the custom of eating all the fats in the home before Lent to prepare for fasting. So why don't we in America say Mars Day instead of Tuesday, right? Well, two was the Germanic name for the god of war. So the Anglo-Saxons just decided to swap out their god's names instead. So Tuesday, there it is. But this also translates to months as well. March is commonly associated with Mars, not because we march into battle, but because in Roman times and until more recent centuries, March began the new year cycle. It was a time of renewal, the spring. So warmer temperatures and melting snow allowed them to start fighting again in full force. So, I mean, yeah, actually kind of they were marching back into battle, I suppose. Um, but speaking of the seasons, they are a little bit different on Mars than they are here on Earth. One year for us Earthlings is 365 days, right? Well, on Mars, it's actually about twice as long at 687 Earth days. 
It does still, though, have four seasons. They're a bit longer than ours here on Earth. Uh, but that means that scientists then actually have to plan ahead when developing solar-powered spacecraft. And sometimes, you know, considering that they don't have as much daylight. But because it also moves at a different rate, about every 26 months, we also come a little bit closer to Mars than normal at what is referred to as the opposition. So this is a great time to study Mars and also a really good time for us to launch spacecraft like Perseverance. But astronomers didn't always know that or have the ability to launch rovers. So instead they had to rely on telescopes to bring it closer to home because you know, with all of its mystery, Mars has actually now become a very major theme in science fiction too. Now, interestingly, the idea of life on Mars might have actually all started due to a bit of a translation error. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli was looking through a telescope and noticed what he referred to as a number of channels on the planet's surface, or what he wrote as cannoli in his language of Italian, not to be confused with cannoli, which is an Italian pastry, which has a channel of cream in it though. But anyway, around that same time, Egypt had constructed the Suez Canal, a magnificent man-made feat of engineering. And so the rest of the world had canals on the brain at the time. And many, like U.S. astronomer Percival Lowell, misinterpreted canali as canal and theorized that those channels were actually constructed by ancient Martian civilizations. So he was fascinated by Mars. He even wrote three books about it and about those canals, as well as other what he called non-natural features, things like oases, which are just basically craters, all alongside this theory that an advanced and desperate civilization was living on Mars and they had built these canals to tap into the the polar ice caps, the last source of water on a cooling and drying up planet. So, I mean, that already sounds like science fiction, right? And then overnight, it just sparked the imaginations of everyone everywhere. Mars was this new destination of possibilities, maybe the home of these fearsome creatures, or maybe a new home for us someday. And it was really exciting because it was near enough to see but not far enough away for us to not know things for, or far enough away to not know things for certain really at this point. So Mars was a blank canvas, what Carl Sagan actually referred to as a kind of mythic arena onto which we've projected our earthly hopes and fears. Now, the earliest stories about Martians were relatively tame. Many stemmed from spiritualists in the late 1800s. One Swiss medium claimed that she was a regular visitor to Mars. She made pictures and actually, as you see here, wrote out Martian communications on paper. Early films also were pretty imaginative too. Thomas Edison's silent film here, A Trip to Mars from 1910, features a scientist who uses anti-gravity dust, there he's covering himself with it, to fly up to the red planet. Uh, this is actually largely considered the first American sci-fi film, and it kind of is fitting given all the dust storms they've been having up there affecting the equipment as of late. Uh, and in it, we see the Mars terrain and also this creepy Martian guy who uh, puts him in a snowball to send him back to Earth. Meanwhile, there was another Danish silent film called A Trip to Mars from 1918 that showed it as a place of peace with vegetarianism and non-alcoholism, which was at the time actually a reflection of Denmark's own changing ideals. So you also saw Mars depicted in literature. Edgar Rice Burroughs turned it into an adventure setting with a whole series of books, starting with his A Princess of Mars, featuring his hero, John Carter, who was an American Confederate soldier who wakes up on Mars with superpowers to fight space aliens and woo the ladies. And of course, another significant cultural phenomenon happened in 1938 when Orson Welles famously adapted H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, the then 40-year-old novel about a Martian invasion of Earth, but he did it on the radio. And it was very creatively designed to sound like news bulletins, but supposedly listeners mistook it for the real thing and hysteria broke out across the country thinking it was the real deal and it was happening. So by the 1950s uh, and the rise of the atomic age, Martian fever was sweeping the nation. It was in children's movies. It was featured in the title of Abbott and Costello go to Mars, even though they don't go to Mars, they actually end up at Venus instead. But it was Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles that took a serious look at colonizing on Mars after its premise that the Earth had been devastated by a nuclear war. So it was a set of short stories depicting interactions between Earthlings and Martians. Unfortunately, we, we uh, bring chicken pox and kill most of them. And we also discover that they have telepathic powers and unhappy marriages and all these things. And we try to carry on the human race as best we can after the Earth is essentially uninhabitable post-war. But then you get to the 1960s. Mariner 4 becomes the first successful flyby of Mars, bringing us for the first time actual closer images of the red planet and 
alas, no aliens, not really any canals either. It was pretty barren, lots of rocks, lots of craters. But seeing Mars in its reality made our collective imagination shift slightly from then on. Mars is still a cultural phenomena, but now it's a bit more based in science. So the 2015 movie, The Martian, is actually a great example of this. The terrain is primarily rooted in what we know, and it really shows how hostile the environment is to humans and the ability to even grow food there, though props to Matt Damon, who obviously is a spectacular potato farmer. <laughs> that is what it is known for, of course. But we haven't entirely let go of whimsy, right? There's still the occasional suggestion of seeing a pyramid or a face on Mars, right? We can't give up how promising it still seems for life of, or some sort of civilization, either the past or the future, whether it be a stepping stone to colonizing the rest of the solar system, like in James Corey's The Expanse, or maybe a home world to hostile aliens coming to get us, like in Mars attacks, uh, or maybe just, you know, an outpost for a certain red patent leather wearing pop princess playing with the hearts of astronauts, right? <laughs> So since landing on Mars last year, Perseverance has been hunting for signs of ancient microscopic life. It'll be the first mission to collect and cache Martian rock soil. And the Ingenuity helicopter has also completed co close to, I believe, 20 short flights now, not only proving that powered controlled flight is possible on Mars, but also helping to scout potential locations for Perseverance to explore too. So Mars 2020 is part of NASA's Moon to Mars exploration approach, which includes the Artemis missions to the moon that will uh, help to prepare us for human exploration someday of Mars uh, in the future. Now, that leads me to something else. Have you this ever wished that you moon. could will uh, the Perseverance rover or the Ingenuity helicopter up close? Because, I mean, you know, it'd be cool to get a really good look at it, maybe walk around it, get a selfie with it, right? Well, guess what, my friends? Now you can. The Intrepid Museum is so excited to announce that we currently have a full-scale model of NASA's Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter in our space shuttle pavilion as part of NASA's nationwide Roving with Perseverance Roadshow. And besides, where else can you say that you saw a Mars rover on an aircraft carrier under a space shuttle, right? <laughs> So this is some great footage uh, from the installation earlier this week. I was actually really surprised at how big it is. It's actually about the size of a car. So these models are going to be on site through June 15th, but don't wait till then to see it. Their arrival actually coincides with one of our biggest on-site festivals, Kids Week starting this Saturday, February 19th through Saturday the 26th, a week later. Our first three days appropriately are themed all about NASA. We are gonna have astronaut Victor J. Glover Jr. who most recently flew aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule Resilience to the ISS, as well as a number of NASA scientists and engineers who will be on site talking all about Mars 2020. And we've also got a whole bunch of demonstrations and activities for the whole family and a number of other really fun partners, everything from live animals to Broadway shows. So really hope you all can come and uh, make it out and join the fun with us at Kids Week uh, coming up this weekend, moving on through next weekend, all next week. Okay, I just like dumped a lot on you, but there you go. <laughs> now you know. Everybody, were you taking there notes you know. on everything that uh, learn about Mars, learn about the rover that's going there? There's Kids Week right. happening, by the way. Um, there'll be a so quiz afterwards. Right. <laughs> That's right. But there really is so much going on, which is why it's exciting that we could share it with all of you. And we want you all to come and uh, check out all the cool NASA days, too, if you're really into space stuff. We love to see the Perseverance rover. Oh, my gosh. We have the rover and, and the helicopter right under the space shuttle right now. I saw it. It's there. Come oh. see it. <laughs> That's I, I actually have been to lots of kids' weeks. We used to do uh, interactive Kerbal booths, and we would set up like computers with big screen TVs, and the kids would all line up, and they would they would play Kerbal, and we'd have people there to showing them the controls and stuff like that. So I I'm not going to kids' week this year, unfortunately, but uh, we've actually been to quite a few of them out there, and it's always a lot of fun. There's guests, there's like booths you can go and see. There's speakers that are coming up. Um, I know it's a little bit different this year, but uh, it really is a cool thing if you're in New York City. If you're anywhere else. I think there's a plan to stream some of the presentations on the Intrepid that channels. That is right. Yes, yes, there is. So we're going to be streaming um, every day at 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. So you will be able to tune in and see our amazing Intrepid education team doing a demonstration from the stage as well as one of our partners uh, each day. And they kind of, they change up. So we'll have different things. Again, we'll have Victor J. Glover Jr. on the first day, who's um, an NASA astronaut, uh, as well as a bunch of other scientists and engineers for those first three days. Um, and then we've got all of these other really great partners too coming in, doing lots of fun demonstrations and shows too. 
Very cool. I want to comment on our channels. I think the rover, the rover is going to be there for a little while, right? It's not just one week or anything. It's sort of a traveling exhibit, isn't it? That's right. Yes, we are so lucky to have it. We are so fortunate. We are so happy to have it. Um, we are actually officially, yeah, opening our doors tomorrow, the one year anniversary <laughs> of the rover. Um, and that is going to be there through June 15th. June so 15th. Make it up for Kids Week. Come on by later on in the spring or the summer, and uh, it'll still be there waiting to, uh, you know, take a selfie with you. <laughs> Good deal. I need to see if I can't sneak through there and uh, walk around it with a live stream camera or something like that. I like taking well, cameras places. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Alicia, um, we are actually a couple of minutes early here. So <laughs> what do we want to do? <laughs> do we want to hang out for a little bit long? We don't have to like stop talking about museum stuff right now or anything. Um, is there anything else going on at the museum we should cover real quick? We've got a whole bunch of stuff coming up. I mean, it's, this year is actually our 40th anniversary, uh, the 40th anniversary of the museum. Um, so 40 years ago, uh, uh, 1982, we were able to open our doors as an actual museum, yep. and we are a converted former um, USS Intrepid. We are an aircraft carrier that was created in World War II and then kind of changed around a bit as, as the, the years went on. Um, but yeah, it was basically rescued from a scrapyard, and uh, you know we were able to open up as a museum and uh, really kind of expanding all of our goals of uh, honoring our heroes, educating the public, and inspiring our youth. Uh, cool. So that's our mission statement, and that's what we've been you know striving to do for the past 40 years. So we have a whole bunch of really great programming coming up, actually both on site and online. Um, lots of public programs. We've been um, giving you some kind of actually exciting behind the scenes look at, at some of the things we've got. We actually have um, a stream that'll be coming up later in the year, um, going through the inside of our space shuttle. If you're curious about that, stay tuned for that. Huh. Um, we're also going to be um, looking at a few other highlights from our collection. So things like in the Growler, which is our Cold War era submarine. Um, we've got another program coming up in May, uh, I believe um, that's going to be highlighting our um, Tomcat, our F-14 Tomcat. Yep. Um, and we also love to bring in people who have a really, you know, interesting or close personal connection to some of these things as well. So we're going to be bringing in a former pilot of that and uh, go through uh, actually the Concorde as well. We've got out on the pier. So we'll be highlighting some of the things from our collection uh, in the coming year, as well as, you know, other neat fun streams that'll give you a look at what our history has been like over the past 40 years. Good deal. I completely put you on the spot. I'm like, hey, we're like two minutes early and you just filled it up exactly <laughs> with time, with more content about what's going on in the museum. <laughs> we really do have so much fun stuff coming up, though. It's true. I mean, I feel like I know I'm just like I'm just writing my map, but it's actually true. There's a laundry list of really great, amazing <laughs> things. And also, you know, I really want to give props to our social media team as well. Um, please do follow us on all of our channels and all like on our Instagram. Um, they're always putting out these amazing highlights of things that we have had happened over the past 40 years with like the date um and you can just see some of the really incredible events that we've hosted and and just neat acquisitions that we've gotten throughout the years too yeah very it's, it's one of the coolest things because on like in the shuttle pavilion right there's a pavilion that has a shuttle in it on the deck of the aircraft carrier yada 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 right it's, yeah there you go that's actually the shuttle pavilion um <laughs> there is a soyuz capsule there it is. And then there is the space shuttle there. And just seeing the difference between here's the Soyuz capsule that still takes astronauts to space. I mean, not that one specifically, but the Soyuz capsule in general. Um, and then the size of the space shuttle and looking at these three little tiny seats that you're sort of cramped in here. And then you look up and you're like, and a space shuttle and a Soyuz and a space shuttle. So, yeah. And, and I will say, too, our Soyuz. So I don't know if anyone knows this. I'm sure you all uh -oh. do. You can we, can we tell like people? Me. This, this. <laughs> Uh, lovely thing behind me here. Um, never actually went into space. Right. It's the space shuttle orbiter prototype, the Enterprise. So it's arguably the most important one, I would say. But it never actually saw space. So sometimes people are disappointed in that. But the Soyuz capsule under it, like you were saying, actually did go into space. We yep. had a very generous donor who actually bought his Soyuz <laughs> after going into space. Uh, and and allowed us to display it um, here at the museum. So we're very lucky to have that as well. But that's cool too. You can actually see scorch marks on yep. the top of it. 
it's it went into space it, it, <laughs> it really is back. it's one of the coolest things like i love seeing flown space hardware up close because you see scorch marks and you see like little parts that are ripped and then when they open the capsule up there's like a crowbar or whatever right you just see that that, that this is a real piece of equipment that has really gone somewhere um it's so cool to be able to see that sort of stuff up close and it's your you can go right up to, to it and see it um and that's not to knock the into enterprise either though you oh, know yeah. even if they go into space there are some um tiles that are missing from the underside because that's true when we did have accidents with past shuttles we were able to well not me not you know us at the museum right. but nasa was able to look at the uh the space shuttle and figure out you know maybe where something went wrong or, or was able to test on an actual version of a space shuttle yep. um see what went wrong and so we actually have some of that history on this as well yep it's it's so important i mean you're like oh it didn't go to space well the enterprise is what they used to figure out if their brick really would fly it was the first glide test flights that they did and they're like well okay yes that actually did fly we tried it in the wind tunnel we drew it we did all these different things but one day they strapped it to the back of a 747 and flew it up in the air and let it go to see what would happen dropped just and dropped just it <laughs> and just glide it on in. That's exactly right. Yep. All right. Well, Alicia, thank you so much. Y'all, again, we do the pre-shows here. This is like the this is the appetizer for the main event that's coming up next. It's Alicia Siegel from the Intrepid Museum. Always a pleasure having you on, Alicia. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful virtual astronomy live tonight, everyone. All See right. <laughs> So, folks, again, if you're just joining us, this is Virtual Astronomy Live. It's a show that I've been doing with Intrepid Museum for almost two years now. Before it was Virtual Astronomy Live, it was Ast Astronomy Night. And we were doing even more shows actually physically at the museum. It pivoted to virtual here, and we thought that it might be the sort of content that we could share with y'all on all the different channels we're going to. My Twitch channel's in here. It's on the NASA Spaceflight YouTube. NASA Spaceflight, thank you so much for the partnership there and helping us share this to a wider audience. It's on the Intrepid channels, twitch.tv slash intrepid museum it's on the intrepid's youtube channels i think it's on facebook i'll have to ask my mom i'm not sure it's everywhere um <laughs> thank you for laughing at that um but uh <laughs> anyways Coming up next, we have our special guest. It's the team lead for the Mars Ingenuity Helicopter. I, th there's all sorts of ways we'll talk about what specifically that is. The first heavier-than-air flight, powered flight, powered control flight, rotor craft on another planet, all the different things. It is going to be Mr. Teddy Zanetos, and he is one of the people on the team responsible, actually the team lead responsible for flying that helicopter. So he's going to be going in-depth with some new stuff from JPL, an interactive map showing where it flies. He's going to be showing us some imagery and some test footage and all sorts of stuff. Before we do that, I got to get them on the call here. It's just a Zoom call. It's not magic, but I do have to get them connected. So while I'm getting them connected, I'm going to roll a little bit of a thing about some programs happening at the museum, and we will be right back. Again, it's, it's two minutes and 30 seconds long, and we will have our special guest from NASA talking about the Ingenuity helicopter as soon as the video is done. Now, please tell me that the audio for the video works. I'm pretty sure it will. Famous last words, Doss. Every year, more than a million visitors embark on a voyage of discovery at Intrepid, a museum on board an aircraft carrier devoted to the intersection of history, science, innovation, and service. They come to the museum to learn, to explore, to engage, and to see firsthand the artifacts that marked critical moments in history and spark our future. They are up close and personal with living history, learning about the past, while contemplating the possibilities of tomorrow through 21st century technology. Within intrepid steel walls are moments, a sense of wonder when a student sees history come alive, goosebumps when a memory is sparked and understanding when a returning service member connects with a fellow veteran. But Intrepid's reach extends far beyond this great carrier's steel walls and decks. Every day, it is making a difference in the lives of so many, in our immediate neighborhood and all around the world. Intrepid also brings learning experiences to students participating in CASA, New York City's cultural after-school adventures program throughout its five boroughs. Designed to support the diverse needs of learners in New York City public schools, Intrepid's CASA programs integrate history, science, technology, engineering, 
arts, and math into out-of-school time experiences to help build in-school success. Our VET video chats reconnect veterans with the legacy of service. My name is Charlotte, and I'm really happy to be connecting with you all. And these are artifacts that are related to work, but also to leisure. We are a ship of ideas, sailing forth to communities near and far, to schools, libraries, housing projects, senior centers, correctional facilities, veterans centers, and children's hospitals to engage and inspire those who can't come to us. All right. If everything's working correctly, I like how I usually like how I ed, like hedge my bets there. I'm like, I don't know, is the audio working? That says the audio is working. Chat, let us know if you can see and hear us. We are back. We've got our uh, friend that you see on every one of the virtual astronomy shows, Miss Summer Ash here. Summer, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. All right. We got audio from Summer as well. Like y'all tell me in chat, you've got audio from Summer. And then also we have the Mars Ingenuity Helicopter Team Lead, Teddy Zanetos. Teddy, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So chat, let us know. Super, super lightweight operation here. Can you hear Teddy okay? Can you hear Summer okay? Are we ready to uh, talk about Ingenuity? It's, I guess they can't answer out loud, so... <laughs> <laughs> They're saying five by five in chat, which sounds good to me. So uh, whenever we want, Summer, Teddy, let's learn about Ingenuity. I'm ready to click on some pictures. Sweet. Let's uh, do it. But uh, before we do that, Teddy, I actually just want to know more about you specifically. So have you always been interested in space, engineering, et cetera, Mars even? So how did you get started in this um, in this field, and then how did you come to NASA? Sure, yeah. Um, the, the the first question: Have I always been, you know, excited about about this field? The answer is yes. Ever since I was a little boy, um, my dad was a sewing machine mechanic, and he had little parts in the in the backyard in his garage that I would always play with and tinker with and have fun taking things apart and putting them back together. Uh, I think that was the beginning of my excitement about about engineering. Uh, uh, that evolved into you know an appreciation of mathematics and physics. Uh, and it kind of snowballed from there. Um, when I uh, went to college, I studied computer science and electrical engineering uh, uh, up in Boston for, for my undergrad and graduate degree uh, at MIT. And, and that's really where I solidified my, my passion for engineering. Um, my road to, to, uh, to, to work in space at, at NASA JPL for, from grad school, I was working uh, in industry for a couple of years. Uh, I worked on, on big electronic uh, producing uh, kind of projects, uh, television manufacturing, uh, low level embedded development systems, uh, worked in a startup uh, for, for some drone uh, racing uh, activities, which was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and eventually I realized, hey, it, it's time to, to move out to the West Coast and join NASA JPL, uh, which has been my home for the last six years. And, and I've been very lucky and very fortunate to be able to work on uh, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter project, um, which has been a wild ride. Time out, time out. Did you say drone yeah. racing? Yes. <laughs> drone racing, like like, yes. did, like drone racing league or something like that? I've seen that on exactly. Twitch before. Exactly, yep, yep. So <laughs> no it's, it's like NASCAR for drones, and, and the the, uh, the idea is to, to build up the technology, right? It's really a technology uh, kind of uh, strategy yeah. so that yeah. you could have pilots wearing First person view goggles and, and zipping around race courses at, at hundreds of miles an hour uh, and really pushing the limits of what drone technology can do. Uh, and, and, you know, we're doing that here on Earth, uh, but that's also what we're doing on Mars. Yeah. Right? We're, we're, we're trying to push the limits in a different direction, but really focusing on what can that aerial aspect do for humanity on Mars, no right? Kidding. And what is that going to do for the next generation? So you went from racing drones on Earth to flying the first ever <laughs> drone helicopter. We'll have to define exactly what it is, like exactly sure, what we sure, call sure, sure. That's amazing. Sorry, I had to jump in all of a sudden. <laughs> Well, that's okay. I was also going to stop him for a second and be like, uh, do you just have a time in your life where you're like, oh, now it's time to go to JPL and that just all works out? Uh, really things, okay. yeah, things kind of just, just, just click naturally. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are various, you know, reasons, uh, you know, in anyone's career, you, you weigh different things. Yeah. Um, but, but it was the right time for me to, uh, to, to really throw my heart and soul into, into working at NASA. I had, it has been a dream of mine ever since I was a little boy. And uh, I was finally able to fill that dream. 
And so you are now the Ingenuity team lead for the operations demonstration phase yes. of the Mars helicopter. When you started at JPL, did you immediately start with the Ingenuity team? No, no. Uh, we, I was actually working on drone racing at JPL as well. Oh. Uh, we, we had an AI drone racing effort uh, where we were trying to take uh, the latest technology in terms of visual, it's called visual inertial odometry. When you combine feature tracking from a camera and inertial sensors like an accelerometer and gyroscope, mm -hmm. um, and you combine all those sensors and you run in, in an algorithm so that a drone can see and, and, and sense where it's moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and we took the latest and greatest in terms of hardware, we took the latest and greatest in terms of uh, software algorithms and threw it on a race quadcopter. Uh, and there's videos online you could see uh, uh it's called it was called the torque project uh where we pitted uh jpl's best software algorithms versus one of you know the world's best uh, uh fpv drone pilots uh in a drone race to see you know where do the the algorithms stack up against a human right so so that's where i started uh when i when i joined jpl uh worked on some rover autonomy uh jpl has a long history of working on rovers and navigation mm -hmm. algorithms uh, and eventually, I, I, I was very lucky where, where I was uh, uh, annoying and bugging enough people to, to ask, you know, is there anyone uh, uh, that, that, that my boss knew that worked on Ingenuity? Uh, at that time, it was just called Mars Helicopter, uh, the Mars Helicopter Technology Demonstrator. Uh, mm -hmm. And eventually, I bugged enough people uh, uh, where I was introduced to our chief engineer, Bob Ballaram. And, and I begged him. I said, hey, is there anything I can do? Is any sort of work? Uh, I, I realize you guys have a team. You're already staffed up. But if there's anything you could do, I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, uh, sign me up. And my first uh, assignments on the project was to develop uh, what's called EGSC. That stands for Electrical Ground Support Equipment. Uh, you could think of that as the life, the life support system uh, for Mars helicopters. So, so wherever, wherever Mars helicopter went, and at that point in time, it was our engineering model. Uh, wherever the EM went, there was a, a, a rack of electronics that traveled along with it. And that was responsible for charging the battery. Uh, safety, maintenance, um, uh, uh, whole sorts of communication features. Uh, so that was my first real, you know, sink my teeth into an effort on, on Ingenuity. Uh, and it snowballed from there. It went from uh, designing life support equipment for the helicopter, if you will, uh, to working on test conducting and, and, and working with, with our entire Mars helicopter team uh, to do our first ever uh, simulated Mars flights uh, in JPL's space simulator chambers. Uh, which was well, uh, a once-in-a-lifetime experience to, to actually be in these facilities, uh, but also to demonstrate that, that yes, uh, in fact, humanity can build an aircraft that can fly on Mars, and here's, here's the proof, right? Um, and that then led to working on our flight model, uh, delivering to the Kennedy Space Center, integrating into the 2020 uh, rover for, for the last time pre-launch, and since then, we've been in our operations phase. Uh, so, so there's crews, uh, operations on the way to Mars, and then you get to Mars, right. you have entry, descent, and landing. Uh, and the whole purpose of Mars Helicopter, though, the whole focus of it was to just prove that we can fly, period. Ingenuity doesn't carry a science payload. Ingenuity doesn't have a whole bevy of sensors like the Perseverance rover does, for example. They have a core science mission that they're trying to, to, to demonstrate, which is super exciting. We can get into uh, later. But Ingenuity's sole purpose was to prove we can fly on Mars, period. Uh, and to do that, we had 30 days, uh, 30 days in which we had planned out five flights. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and thankfully, they all, all went extremely well. Uh, and, and after that 30-day that window, we were extended into our uh, operations uh, demonstration phase, which we're currently in and continue to operate in uh, now that we've uh, flown 19 successful uh, flights in the last nine months. Uh, I was going to say JPL has a reputation for sort of setting a, that goal <laughs> and then just blowing past it for years and years and years. And so, how long is Ingenuity going to be going on Mars? Do you think? So, so it's it's a it's a tough question to answer. And 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 the the truth of it is is that we don't know. Um, every soul, and that's what we call a day on Mars. Every soul could be Ingenuity's last. Every okay. flight could be, could be its last. Um, but we are we are hoping for the best and we're planning for the best and and working on on feature upgrades we're working on so flight software upgrades for ingenuity to, to to make it even more capable than it already is and planning out uh, uh many many flights ahead into the future uh so that we can continue helping perseverance um but going back to, to the first point it's really uh anyone's guess um 
we design Ingenuity to survive the cold, bitter winters on Mars uh, uh, for 30 days, right? And, and 30 days only. Uh, we are a, a tech demonstrator. What that means in, yeah. in terms of NASA uh, terminology is that we're, we're high risk, high reward, right? We are not built to the same specification and the same reliability. That, that's the really important part to, to, to understand um, is that we are not as reliable as the rover is, for example. Uh, Perseverance has dual redundant systems. Uh, th there's backups uh, that, that will take over automatically if there's an issue that's detected, fail safes, uh, whereas Ingenuity does not, right? Uh, and it cannot afford to have that uh, for many reasons, chief of which is mass, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, so so the, the, air on, the air at Mars is 1% the density uh, of Earth's here, here at sea level. Uh, that's almost nothing, right? When you think of 1%, sounds small. Uh, and, and the best example that I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've given in the past is you wave your hands around here on Earth and then the hairs on, on your arm can kind of feel the air brushing across. There is actually molecules pushing those hairs, right? Imagine those molecules. Now there's 1% the number of little particles brushing up against, uh, against your arm. You wouldn't feel a thing, right? That's how little air there is on the surface of Mars. Um, and that's a challenge when you're trying to fly, right? That's a challenge when you're trying to build an aircraft. Uh, to, to be able to fly and, and be stable and be able to control that vehicle and tell it to go exactly where you want. Um, and, and to do that, uh, th there's a lot of exciting uh, control problems, a lot of exciting uh, uh, physics involved, but it really just boils down to uh, the, the key challenges are you need to keep it light. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ingenuity is 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds total. Um, yeah, I was just looking up what other things are four pounds. And I found a website that said like your coat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. So, so ingenuity is very a light. Bottle of ketchup, a big yep. bottle of ketchup. <laughs> right. So, so, so it's very light, um, yeah. and you need to have your your blades as large as possible, and you need to spin them as quickly as possible. Right now, now our our diameter, one point two meters from tip to tip. Uh, that's limited by the speed of sound on Mars, but also how much space we were allowed to accommodate underneath the belly of the rover. Sure. Um, our rotors spin from 2,500 to 2,700 revolutions per minute. All right, so extremely fast. So, so you build your aircraft very light, you spin the blades very quickly, right? And you also need the autonomy, right? Uh, Mars is so far away, um, you could have like a 15 minute round trip signal delay uh, right. depending on where the two planets are uh, in their orbits around the sun. And that means you can't joystick ingenuity. Uh, uh, everything needs to be autonomous. Everything needs to be on board. Uh, and, and the way ingenuity flies is we send up a sequence. Uh, and it's a, effectively just an instruction sheet that ingenuity reads off. And yeah. it says, do this, 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 and this. And there's some contingencies in there. There's some backups uh, in case things don't go as planned. But there's no human intervention. As soon as we hit send, and that sequence gets radiated up through the deep space network, Ingenuity's on its own. And, and, and we wait for the next Sol to elapse. We downlink the results and, uh, and hope for the best and keep, keep repeating that process uh, for as long as we can. Um, so I have lots more questions, but I also wanted to remind everybody who's watching today that we're switching it up a little and so we're not saving all of the questions until the, the end of the event. So if you're already thinking of questions and you, just have burning ones that you need to ask Teddy, um, put them in the chat. And um, from time to time, Das is going to jump in with them when they sort of come along and fit perfectly with what we're talking about. Or if they just take us in a cooler direction, why not? I, I could actually jump in with one really quickly, if that's cool. Yeah, is that it. cool? Yeah. And y'all remember, tag us. Like if you're watching on some other channel, you probably know how to tag us on, on NASA Space Flight YouTube. It's asked at, at NASA Space Flight on my Twitch. Put the word question in. Like there's different ways to tag us. And I have like 15,000 question queues up here now. Um, it's actually only five, but whatever. Um, so get us get us some more questions in here. We'll see, we, we'll see if we can answer them across the course of the show. But I was going to say... That was something that I didn't really think of. You don't have redundant systems. Like the Mars rover is like multiple computers and then backup systems and then backups to the backups. And that's why the JPL folks are like, all right, 15 days on Mars, we're going to get you a really good picture of a rock. And then like nine years later, it's like, oh, hey, there's another rock. Might as well take a picture of it too. <laughs> um, but the helicopter's not that way. It's not like you added a third rotor or extra legs or anything like that. Like if something happens... Are all the critical? There's not a single backup system on the whole thing, is there? 
so so we do have uh, some limited uh, uh, redundancy. Um, uh, without getting too into the nitty gritty, uh, the way Ingenuity operates is that we have our our Snapdragon processor. Uh, you can think of it as a cell phone processor from yeah. a couple of years back. Uh, our Snapdragon processor, it's it's used for all of the visual compute. And then we have uh, two redundant microcontrollers that are, that are responsible for speaking to our IMU sensors, processing the IMU data as quick as possible. That is actually one element in which we can have a little bit of redundancy if we detect there's an issue with one and we can plan the next flight uh, around that. Okay. Um, but in general, uh, as with most technology demonstrators, um, you can find several single point failures, several aspects of the design where if one servo uh, happens to not work properly, or one rotor motor, as, as you pointed out, or the camera lens uh, uh, gets covered, or, uh, or you name it, there's, there's throughout the entire design, there's aspects where everything needs to work correctly, and then the next step must work correctly, and then the next step must work correctly for a flight to occur. Yep. Um, and we, we, did, we did our best to, to minimize you know, the number of single point failures and, and, and maximize how reliable it could be but still keeping it within that 1.8 kilograms, keeping within that small volume, uh, that, that, that makes it a fun challenge to, to go about. Gotcha. I was, I was going to say, like, I laughed and I looked at the closet because in my closet over here, I have a, an RC helicopter, like one of those old 3D, full, fully articulated helicopters okay. Okay, that yeah, has yeah. never flown. Because I know <laughs> if I try to fly it, it's been in there for 15 years. I've had it carried from, like, four different places I've lived, and I have sure. never flown it because I know if I do... That's going to be the last time it ever flies. <laughs> I'm going to crash the heck out of it. But you flew 19 times on Mars with the helicopters. That's that's why I literally can see the box not sponsored by that company or anything. But uh... so, so 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 word of advice from uh, you know I I also flew RC helicopters yep. uh, back in the day and I still have one collecting dust in my garage. Um, but but yeah, when you do take it out and you go for a first flight, make sure that you uh, have a bunch of spare parts. Yep. Get ready to rebuild the thing from the ground up. Um, and now, thankfully, we we haven't run into those issues with Ingenuity, and you know, knock on wood, uh, we'll continue to, to operate safely and, and and fly for many many uh, uh, hundreds of meters and hopefully kilometers to come. Cool. Um, but but that's that just goes to testing, right? Yep. Uh, uh, you 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 test. You test the crap out of everything you want to send to space. Right? Gotcha. Space is an expensive endeavor, and and before you send something up and you go through a launch process, you want to make sure, to the best of your ability and with the budget and the schedule that you have, you've exposed any potential errors, so that you want to minimize those surprises once you get to the surface. Yeah, makes sense. There was there was a follow up question. I'm, I was going to go on from there, but there was a follow up question relevant to something you just said. Um, you said like an older cell phone processor, the Snapdragon processor. Uh, Digital said, I read that Ingenuity was built with a lot of off-the-shelf consumer components. Are they still functioning well? Like, A, is that true? It's stuff that you could just order off <laughs> off your favorite online retailer or whatever. <laughs> um, yes. In uh, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And, and that's part of, uh, I, I hope, will be will be the new wave of, uh, of development and the new mentality uh, that we can continue to push at, at JPL and, and NASA as a whole is to rely more on these capable uh, commercial off-the-shelf COTS, COTS. Uh, components, right? Just like the Snapdragon uh, was COTS, uh, and it's been replaced now. There's newer generations. But, but our, our Snapdragon processors COTS, our microcontrollers, um, our, our IMU sensors, right, our, our cameras, all of those components straight off the shelf. And, and you know, you go a couple of years back, anyone could have purchased them. Um, and, and there's value in relying on that, in that you get the cutting edge, uh, bleeding edge capabilities of compute, right? Um, you're not as reliable as something that, that, that the Perseverance rover uses, for example, right, like a RAD 750 computer. Uh, th that RAD uh, uh, name in the, in the beginning means it's radiation hardened, right? Uh, it, it can withstand a, a, a much more treacherous radiation environment than Ingenuity can. Right, so if God forbid there's a there's a radiation storm uh, on our way towards Mars, and if that's happening during one of our flights, for example, um, we we would be much more susceptible uh, than anything else on the planet because it's a cell phone processor. It's not designed for that. It's not it's not built to that spec. The actual transistors are much smaller, much tinier, and therefore an incoming uh, uh, photon, an incoming particle, high energy uh, 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 X-ray, for example, could flip a bit from a zero to a one, or vice versa. Uh, so it's it's all part of the complex trade space when you send anything up to space. 
Um, but we needed that. We need COTS uh, components and we need the performance that you can only find with a COTS processor to have any chance of trying to fly real time, capture 30 frames per second of images and incorporate it into your algorithm and keep doing it consistently throughout flight. Uh, it couldn't have been done and kept within our mass margins without the advantage of COTS parts. Nice. Very cool. Again, y'all, I'm looking at questions as they come through. Um, Summer, back to you. But if y'all have questions that are relevant to what we're talking about, we're going to try to mix them out through the entire show. So uh, keep let's keep on going. Yeah, I had a question about one of the redundancies or lack of that you were talking about with the camera. So, mm -hmm. And just now you were talking about taking the images and incorporating them into the algorithm. Yep. So does that mean it's, and it also, is it an optical, like visible light camera? Yes. So, so, so right. it's a, right. it's necessary for the flying. Yes. Yeah. So, so we have a, a black, we have, we, we have a black and white, uh, GA quality, um, mm -hmm. uh, downward facing camera that we use for feature tracking. So, so effectively you can think of it as we're looking for edges. Uh, mm -hmm. we're looking for, 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 for representative edges in an image. So if you take a picture of, of the Martian surface, you're looking for rocks, you're looking right. for sharp edges, for example, um, whereas sand, it's very difficult to track. And what happens is it's, it's a pretty simple concept to wrap your head around. Uh, we take an image, right? And then the helicopter moves and then it takes another image and you match up features from one instant mm -hmm. in time to the next. And you see how much did that rock in the field of view move, right? Based off of how many pixels in the image it moved, you can make some determinations about how fast you must be moving, what rotations you experienced in between those moments in time. And you also combine that with your onboard accelerometer and gyroscope. Um, so yes, we're using a, a, a black and white camera, downward facing, VGA quality uh, for feature tracking. And then we also have a color, high resolution, 13 megapixel imager. That, that's like your cell phone quality camera, right? And that's actually uh, tilted a little bit. It's not downward facing, it's tilted forward. So we can capture a little bit of the, of the terrain in front of us. Um, and that's what we're using for for our scouting function, right? Uh, I know we have a bunch of examples, and and hopefully we'll, we'll get that soon of some of some of the 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 exciting you know accomplishments that Ingenuity has been able to accomplish from a scouting perspective, right? Uh, I said earlier our whole purpose was to prove that we can fly. Check, we're done. Right. Um, that was true for our tech demo mission, for our operate for our operations demonstration now. Our, our mission has changed, right? Our mission is to be that scout, is to provide the critical imagery from that camera that we just talked about for the Perseverance Rover team. Got it. So is Perseverance and Ingenuity talking to each other at all when Ingenuity is flying? Uh, yes. So, so, so what happens is uh, there is actually a base station about the size of a tissue box mm -hmm. uh, uh, attached on the, on the side of Perseverance. There's a little antenna. 900 megahertz antenna uh, that we use to communicate between the rover and the helicopter. And you can think of Perseverance as, as kind of our, our relay station. All the commands and all the signals that come from Earth, they go through the deep space network, they get sent down to the, to the Perseverance rover, and yeah. on souls in which we plan activities, the base station will communicate to the helicopter and vice versa. And while we fly, uh, we try and send and transmit data back uh, uh, from the helicopter back to the base station on the rover. And that's how we get our data eventually down to the ground. Right. Yeah, you're not gonna send it from the helicopter straight to the Goldstone antenna. No, no, unfortunately we don't have that that sort of uh, transmit power, uh, yeah. maybe in future generations, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, right. Yeah, you, you definitely wanna uh, leverage the, the amazing orbiter infrastructure that we have at Mars. Exactly. Um, when you're trying to send large volumes of data back to Earth. Um, and there are, there's different ways to communicate to Mars, to assets on Mars. You can send directly from DSN stations. You can send mm -hmm. directly to, to uh, the rover, for example. It's called direct from Earth communications. Um, or you can send your data to the orbiters and the orbiters will then relay that back down. Mm -hmm. uh, so a bunch of different options, but, but just to get back to your question, uh, yes, while we're flying and, and while, the, while the helicopter's on, we're always beaconing back telemetry back to the base station. Uh, so long as the base stations there are allowing us to, uh, it's an important actual, uh, uh, communication safety or, or emissions aspect of, of the ingenuity design is that, uh, the helicopter listens before it talks, right? It, it will mm -hmm. never transmit unless it's specifically and explicitly commanded to. So, so in the beginning of our activities, the base station will say, go ahead, give me your latest, send me your latest, send me your latest. And that's, that's when we'll get a chunk of telemetry back to process. 
doing it. Um, can you tell me more about how you actually, like what the test setup looks like on earth for testing a helicopter that needs to fly in a Martian atmosphere? Yeah, yeah. So I think Das has some uh, some images and some videos. There we go. So, I have a so lot. What you're looking, yeah. So, so what <laughs> you're looking at here is uh, is is uh, this amazing chamber uh, that we have at NASA JPL. It's called the 25 foot space simulator. Uh, and what this is is you can think of it as a big can, big tube, yeah. 25 feet in diameter, uh, several stories tall. And almost everything that JPL has sent out to space uh, has been in this chamber at one point or the other. And, and it's, it's for what we call during our verification campaigns, uh, we call it thermal vac testing. All right. So, so thermal vacuum uh, is the acronym TVAC. Um, and this chamber is our s simulator for space, right? We can pump the air out. We can go down to a hard vacuum. Uh, we can then squeak in a little bit of air to match whatever density we'd like, like for example, on Mars. Um, we can flood the walls uh, uh, with liquid nitrogen, so we can make the entire chamber very, very cold, right? We have a solar simulator in there with these very powerful kilowatt bulbs that can shine down from above and beam down onto whatever space article you put in there. So you could simulate what does solar radiation feel like if you're, if you're close to the sun or orbiting around Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes care of most of the challenges when you're trying to make a, a, a simulated Mars uh, in Pasadena, California, right? Uh, right? The last bit of it uh, was gravity, right? So we don't have, yeah. uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have anti-gravity. Um, what we do have are, are some, uh, we, we have physics, right? And what we had to make, uh, we, we didn't have this at our fingertips. We, this wasn't laying around. And this is part of the fun aspect of doing something for the first time ever, right? Uh, we've built rovers before. We know how to build rovers. We have a lot of lessons learned. Uh, there is no instruction manual for building a helicopter. And we had to design this on the fly was to make a gravity offload system. And what that is, is uh, you could think of it as a high tech fishing reel uh, with a motor, a torque sensor, a pulley, and you have a fishing line that we use to wrap around that pulley. Uh, and, and in the image that, that you're looking at here, uh, about three, four stories above, we had our gravity offload system. Uh, with the fishing line coming down, attaching to the top of the helicopter. And what its job was, was to provide the perfect amount of tug upwards to cancel out the fraction of gravity that shouldn't be there for the helicopter to feel like it was on the surface of Mars. So when you combine all these elements, the, the thermal, uh, the density that we can actually pump out the air and get it to Mars density, the temperature, and finally that gravity offload, that provided the full picture so, uh, for us so that we could test out what is it like to fly, what is it like to survive a night, which is an extreme challenge, right? Uh, what is it like to charge on the surface of Mars and check as many boxes as, as was possible uh, before we were able to, to, to verify and, and bless that the vehicle was ready for launch. I, can yeah, that I... really sounds a lot easier than trying to get that chamber on the Vomit Comet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hey, can, can I ask real quick, earlier you said that the uh, it was tough to look down at sand and see the motion, right? Like yeah. it's just a big flat expanse of sand and that's tough to do like visual recognition with. Is that why somebody had the intern put a bunch of tape X's on the bottom of the, uh, exactly. the floor here? Yep. That's exactly why we we uh, uh, and th those weren't interns. That that was uh, that was us. That was y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was about eight of us with a bunch of rolls of uh, of tape. Uh, yeah, walking around the chamber floor. But exactly like you said, um, we, we needed to make features uh, on this on this pristine surface. Otherwise, the, the vehicle wouldn't be able to track anything. Yeah. Was there any rhyme or reason to it? Like, okay, nope. eight millimeters, or just put nope, some down nope, some nope. X's. What, what you're looking for is random and unique uh, ah. features, right? So what you don't want are repeating patterns. Yep. You want to keep it random because uh, repeating patterns that could start now confusing uh, uh, your, your algorithm and thinking, did we just teleport? Right. Um, but, uh, but you want unique features randomly spaced. Uh, so, so we just, had at it and, and, and had some fun taping things down. It was a cool. lot more difficult getting the tape off <laughs> when we were done with the test, but, but yeah. It's like now you have to clean up the fancy chamber that has like an artificial yep. sun and artificial gravity and artificial, yep. like all this stuff. Now go clean up your tape. Um, oh, yeah, a lot of cleanup. <laughs> Excellent. And Teddy, there's a ton of great videos like this. So I, if I just bring one up um, and you want to yeah. say what it is, I, yeah, yeah, I, there's so many good videos of these tests. I'm literally just going to click through some of them real quick. Go for it. Um, let's see here. We've got, I'm just going to scroll up. This one, the helicopter looks like it's upside down. 
Yes. So <laughs> so uh, the 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 theme that that permeated the entire verification campaign of, of Ingenuity was to baby step our way, right? We didn't just build a helicopter and say, all right, let's go fly, right? You, you don't want to do that. You want to baby step your way forward, may, test small incremental uh, additions towards towards your final capability, and then you, you, you release it and say, let's fly. This was one of those incremental steps where we were trying to test our attitude control system, right? So as the helicopter is flying and hovering, uh, let's imagine the, the hovering problem is solved. You just want to make sure that if you command a roll or a pitch of you know 10 degrees, that the helicopter is able to get there, hold, and get there and hold, right? Um, so that's why you see uh, if you pl if you press play in this video, you'll see the helicopter actually roll slightly uh, inside of our test chamber because we're commanding it to, to, to hit that certain roll angle. Um, but the reason it's upside down is is we're trying to avoid ground effect. Um, whenever you have a helicopter, uh, you wind up getting the circulation currents when you're near the ground. So the air gets shot down through your rotor discs right. uh, and they circulate back up in a torus shape. Exactly. Just like that. <laughs> and, and you don't want those circulating backwards uh, up into your, 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 your airflow again. Oh, that'll, that'll give you control issues. Uh, so instead, what we did is flip the helicopter upside down. So now the air is getting shot up and we have several stories of space above us. So it was very difficult to form any circulation currents that would affect our results and give us non-meaningful uh, answers in terms of how well was the helicopter handling. I, I figured it's if you're sending a flying vehicle to Mars, you got to be prepared. If you meet a Martian, you have to make sure you can keep up with international relations. <laughs> <laughs> Interplanetary relations. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no comment. No, no. <laughs> so, 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 uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the 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 ability, you know, for for for, hel for the helicopter to keep up on attitude, I can talk to that, right? And it, it, this video shows we're able to keep up there. Um, but uh, in terms of international relations, I'll, I'll leave that to others to answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see here. I'm I'm literally just clicking on a couple now. Um, That's these look like question. yeah, of course. Uh -huh. Did uh, Ingenuity need to do any like unfolding or was it stored in its full operational configuration? That's a, that's a great question. How did and, get and, out so, of the rover? Yeah, yeah. So, so that was part of our, uh, our, our deployments phase our, right before commissioning. And I think, Dosh, you should have a, a GIF of that. Uh, yes, I have lots of that. Somewhere. Yeah. I'm getting it. <laughs> right. So um, Ingenuity was stowed in, under the belly of the rover. Right. right. So before, when we went to when we went to uh, the Kennedy Space Center and we did our final integration, uh, and you can see here an example of it, the rover is actually upside down right now, and you can see Ingenuity uh, on the belly, and we're tucked in sideways. Okay. It's like so, a little so, captive carry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so uh, Ingenuity is rotated sideways uh, under the belly to provide the maximum wheel clearance for Perseverance once it gets to the surface mm -hmm. of Mars. Um, and not only are we sideways, but our legs are folded up, okay? Right. So our legs are folded up to make sure that we can avoid any clearance issues. Uh, and, 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 you know, without, without our legs folding, we would provide a massive obstruction uh, for the rover to try and drive, uh, you know, small. We, if it was trying to drive over a rock, one of our right. legs would snap, yeah. right? Um, so, so, Das, do you have uh, one of the, uh, the animations of our deployment phase? Looking for it. Keep talking. Just talk slow. Okay. <laughs> so... Once we arrived on Mars, uh, we, we went through the EDL phase, uh, right. and there was a carbon fiber debris shield that was dropped, that was deployed. Uh, and after, after our debris shield was deployed, the, the Perseverance team uh, thankfully found us a very nice, uh, very flat uh, uh, deployment area where, where we were going to, and this is a video of, of what that carbon fiber debris shield looks like. In the uh, slowest of motion. Like this in the slowest, slowest of motion. Of motion. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, uh, I guess you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the, the 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 goal was to find an airfield, the 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 our our, our safest possible area for the helicopter to be dropped, uh, yeah. one where the helicopter where the rover would be able to drive over the drive helicopter away. after deployment, drive away to a safe standoff distance, and that was our home base of operations when we started our mission. Um, there were a lot of metrics that went in, that were involved there in terms of how many rocks are there per square meter, what is the local flatness uh, in terms of terrain slope, what is the long-term slope, so over 50 meters or 100 meters, what is the slope, uh, and we found several locations that were suitable right near where Perseverance performed its EDL uh, and, and final, you know, descent. Um, 
so we were very lucky to, to, to have that landing site nearby. But going back to the to the deployments phase, do you have uh, do you happen to have one of the gifts handy for going through the actual deployments? Let's see. I think I got them all in a line here. So oh, okay, uh, here's the second one. So so, so so yeah, first stage is carbon fiber debris shield drop, right? right? Um, and then second one, uh, I believe it's playing here. You'll I think that so in slow. this second <laughs> very slow. I think in this second video stage, you'll see us start to rotate vertically, right? So so carbon debris carbon fiber debris shield drops. There are some uh, some latches and some mechanisms which I think are skipped here in this video. Uh, and now we're going to rotate down to our vertical orientation, and then we would latch vertically, right? Mm -hmm. We're still attached. We have an electrical umbilical still going yeah. through the, our, through our solar panel mating interface back yeah. to the base station. So perseverance was still charging us. We could still communicate and, and read life and vital signs of, of of ingenuity. And by that I mean battery temperature. I mean uh, the cell voltages of our battery. Um, uh, and and th those were the main metrics we were concerned with. Once we were vertical, we were, you could see now there's two legs in their downward yeah. deployed phase, and there's two legs still folded up. Yeah. Those two legs that are still folded up, we needed to swing down. So we had these little uh, uh, grabbers that were wrapped around the ankles, um, which would then open up, release the legs, and they were spring-loaded to actually flip and rotate down. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so they were spring loaded to flip and rotate down. And that's the final stage of deployments. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still attached to the rover at this point. Right. Uh, and the very, very final part, there's something called a frangible, bolt, uh, which there was a single bolt coming down the central axis and, and latching into our mating interface at the solar panel. And uh, frangible is very cool. Uh, the way they work is they're, they're specifically designed uh, to fracture at, at, a, at a predetermined point. Um, yeah. once you apply enough uh, force against them. So, so you heat up this shape memory alloy, it provides enough uh, stress, so it actually starts expanding the bolt. And once mm -hmm. the bolt gets expanded enough, it'll snap. Uh, right. And that, that's what was responsible for the final deployment of the helicopter. We dropped down to the surface, we landed on all four legs, and then the rover drove off of us. That, was the, that was the beginning of our technology demonstration mission. Yeah. Do everybody notice the techs in the background and the bunny suits watching this? I, I say techs, <laughs> uh, engineers. I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but uh, yeah, yep. everybody's like watching the the deployment. And this is like it's like 3,000 frames per second or something like this. This is not real time. Uh, no, no, yeah. So, so, so a lot of a lot of our initial testing and verification campaign, we have a lot of footage, super slow mo, to make sure we understand exactly what's happening in each frame, uh, so that it worked out perfectly on Mars. Very cool. It is really so cool. And, and uh, I guess we were getting a little bit into where that deployment phase was. Uh, Dot, do you want to pull up the, um, the orbital map? There's a, there's a map that's available to the public. For, for those of you that are interested, you go to mars.jpl.nasa.gov slash maps, and you can look at the progress of the Perseverance rover and, and the Ingenuity helicopter. Are, and we can zoom in. Yeah. Oh, there are, you go. Are yep. we allowed to do that? Like... We're not going to like crash the JPO website or anything, are we? No, 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 no. Don't worry. This is this is not our, our this is not our critical uh, 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 server here. Those are all protected. Um, gotcha. So you can zoom in and and you can uh, see where we originally landed and performed EDL. Uh, and, like and what? I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And what I'd like to point out is is our is our there's the Octavia E Butler landing site, but there's also our Wright Brothers Field. And the Wright Brothers field is this oval shaped airfield uh, in the oh, yellow right, dotted yeah. line area. That was our home for our tech demo. That was our original uh, home base of operations um, and, and, and right next to where we were deployed uh, by Perseverance at the start of the tech demo. Uh, we stayed there for, for our first few flights. Our first flight was the most important one, just take off, hover, come back down and land. And then we started uh, expanding uh, the envelope and, and really pushing the limits of what's possible. Uh, so and, speaking of the Wright brothers, did you have like a little pop-off panel that then had like a Martian license plate saying first in flight? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, no, no, not quite. No, what we, <laughs> no what we did have is a, is a little swatch from the original uh, uh, Wright brothers flyer um, cool. th that we were able to, to get. Uh, um, and, I, and I mean from the first yeah. aircraft that, that ever flew here on Earth. Uh, we were able to take a little piece of the fabric that was used for the, for the wings on the original Wright Flyer, uh, and we tuck that underneath the solar panel. It was a little bit of good luck uh, for us in our first flight on Mars. Oh, that's um, so cool. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So, so a little, little bit of luck from home. Yeah. 
Sorry, I interrupted you. Were you going to talk more about oh, uh, moving yeah. out so, from the, the so, so, so for, for the audience playing along at home here, uh, you, you can pull up this website and 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 have fun, explore, and, and track both Perseverance and Ingenuity's progress in, in the in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, but what I wanted to – the point I was trying to drive home here is um, right now we're zoomed way in on, on our original uh, Wright Brothers field. Uh, and, Dasa, if you could zoom out a little bit. Absolutely. And, and, start give, and, and to start giving people uh, an idea of how far we've come, right? Um, that little strip – uh, of area, uh, just a couple dozens of meters was our tech demo. That's all we signed up for in our 30 days uh, of our mission. Since then, like uh, we've up there, that little yep. strip like that, or even smaller. That's it. That's it. <laughs> no right. Kidding. So, so that, that little strip was our original home base of operations. Uh, since then when we were extended past our tech demo mission. Uh, we've been very lucky in that we've been able to execute the last, uh, what well, we've done 19 in total, uh, five in the tech demo. Right. Um, and, in all, we've covered just about 3.8 kilometers, and that's the yellow path. If you trace the yellow path out, you'll see where each one of our flights has been. Uh, and and just recently, you know, as of last week, we returned back across the the thumb of Sita here. That's the region we're talking about, uh, and and we're getting ready for our next journey to the River Delta. But we can come back to that to, to that in a bit. Um, more on this map, that the white path is where Perseverance has been. So you can see Perseverance went clockwise all the way into into the CETA area that we're talking about, uh, went in and actually drove into the CETA thumb, and then it's starting its return journey back up to our original EDL landing site. Um, Real quick, can we orient people? Because there was like a mitten involved here um, when you when you <laughs> yeah, trained yeah. me on it. Yeah, yeah. So, you say so, the thumb. So if you, if you can, yeah. So if you can draw, there, there's a, there's a. We call this the thumb of Sita. There, there's this mitten that we imagine. <laughs> so, so exactly. So, so it's a downward facing uh, a mitten, and that's the thumb of Sita that we've been. Uh, both the Perseverance and, and the Ingenuity helicopter have been calling home now for the last nine months. Uh, we're getting ready to, to relocate. We're looking for a new home, uh, and that is the River Delta. The, the reason. Uh, Perseverance came here in the first place, and, and I guess we didn't, we haven't touched on this yet. Perseverance's mission, uh, and the, the whole point of Mars 2020, uh, is to collect samples, seal them up, uh, you know, hermetically seal them up in these, you know, biologically kind of isolated containers, um, and prepare them for return to Earth in the next handful of years. Um, Perseverance won't be bringing them back. There's going to be a, another mission. Uh, that's going to be responsible for collecting the samples, sending them up into orbit on Mars, capturing them in orbit around Mars, and then shooting them back here to Earth. Uh, but Perseverance is the first critical phase in that mission. And it goes back to the original question of why are we here? Why do we pick this location? Right? Um, there's Mars is massive. Uh, did we just choose a random location? Did we just free fall from the sky? No, this was specifically chosen uh, because of its proximity uh, to a river delta. So, so as we're zoomed out now, you can see the you can see an outline uh, on the left hand side of the screen uh, that looks like if you were to look here uh, on Earth, if you were to look at some orbital imagery, uh, what looks like a river. And at the end of that river, just like here on Earth, uh, there tends to be river deltas. Uh, and here on Earth, river deltas are extremely uh, biologically diverse areas, right? And and uh, we hope that that may hold true and may contain you know samples of interest uh on mars and, and that's why you know that's why 2020 landed here is 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 it's right near a lot of exciting uh, uh locations for the scientists um and that's our next goal is to get to the river delta i hope there's not like a mars terrain scientist somewhere who's shaking their head at my drawing of the river delta <laughs> i was pretty no, close there's, right there's, no there's there's probably a couple uh, uh that are gonna that are gonna be shaking at their head because I'm not using the right terminology. So I apologize in advance to to, 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 to those of us uh, to th those of you on, on the team. And, and you know, I'm really good at helicopter terminology, not so great at geology. And I can't draw river deltas, so it's fine. We're all we're all on the same page here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay because we have gorgeous images. <laughs> yeah. So how far from where things are now? And you said perseverance is going back to where it landed. Right, and then right. from there, it's going to go to the Delta. Right. So, so, so the long-term goal here is 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 uh, Perseverance is gearing up right now for this yeah. for this extensive drive um, that's going to follow around the mitten. 
around that that the, the, the CTOM mitten that we had drawn out before. Right. Um, Ingenuity, uh, yeah. we're preparing to actually take a shortcut. Uh, instead of flying around the mitten, uh, just like we did at the thumb of CETA, where we flew right across uh, in flight nine for, for a record breaking 625 meters, uh, we're, we're planning on breaking some new records uh, here pretty soon in the next couple of weeks and uh, next couple of months. We're going to shoot across to the northwest. So, so instead of trying to drive around the mitten, yeah, exactly that blue line, uh, we're going to attempt to cut out that extra distance. Uh, and, and, and and fly right across. Um, we can do that, right? Because we flying. can skip all the challenging terrain, right? The rover can't do that. Rovers in general wouldn't attack from that vector uh, because of the terrain hazards, right? Large boulders, divots in the ground, um, hazards to the mission. Uh, our job as the helicopter team is to look at the orbital imagery, look at the, <laughs> the, 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 the actual terrain and try and chart out safe islands that we can land on. Right, and that, that that's the homework that we've been doing in the last couple of months is to look at this path, this traverse, yeah. look for safe, you know, safe landable areas. How safe big are ports. those areas? Say again? Ports, even though it's not. Exactly, yeah, it's <laughs> safe ports, it's safe yeah. aerial ports, if you will. Um, yeah. And we're looking at the terrain, and we're also looking at the telecom. We want to make sure that wherever we fly, we'll still be able to communicate back to home base. We'll still mm -hmm. be able to have a good link to the Perseverance rover as it does its, its journey along the red uh, path here. Exactly. That's the international sign for a radio signal, like a yep. jagged line, isn't it? That, that's, that's, the, that's the engineering yeah, standard. We use that all the yep. time, Doss. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah, you, you work at the VLA, so I take your word as gospel on that summer. Hey, Teddy, which one should I have written? Should I have written drone, heli, helicopter, chopper? Like, what's the right <laughs> terminology? I, I think heli's uh, the, the most common uh, uh, shortening or the most common uh, uh, quick form way to refer to Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, drone has other you know connotations, and 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 chopper has you know other memes meme like uh, connotations. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, heli's uh, heli's the short form that we like to use. Gotcha. That's that's why I asked. It's not like the Martian motorcycle that you've deployed out there or anything. Yeah. Like that. No. Okay. No. Cool. All right. Excellent. What's the time frame for? You mentioned that it's going to embark on this soonish. Yeah. But yeah. What kind of time frame are you talking about? Like. So so I, in the next two months, in, in the next yeah. two months, uh, uh, we're gearing up for this journey. Okay. Um, we just executed Flight 19, uh, uh, you know, about a week ago, yeah. uh, and we're getting ready for for Flight 20 in the next week, week and a half. Um, as we're doing that, the rover is going to be getting close to to its. Uh, close to the OEB, the original landing site. Right. Uh, and there'll be some exciting activities that the rover's going to be taking on. And then it's, it's off to the races. Uh, Ingenuity will start its Northwest Passage. Uh, and then and then the rover will go around uh, uh, the CETA mitten. And and I, I also want to say that they've been uh, uh, doing uh, a, a record-breaking sort of uh, 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 trend in terms of progress. Um, so in the last couple of sols, they, they've really been pushing the limits of uh, not just what can the rover platform do on its own, uh, but the autonomy needed to have autonomous drives, hands off from sol to sol to sol, uh, and, and it's it's going to keep us it's going to keep the ingenuity team on its toes, and it's going to keep us uh, excited and, and ready to go as fast as we can uh, to race to the delta. Yes, I, you have a question. I literally raised my hand. <laughs> Um, yes. So, yes, Das, you have a question. Now i got to remember what the question was. Um, you, you were talking about flying across the, the mitten, right? Yeah. And I just wanted to clarify, you were looking at satellite imagery because you're not just going to do one marathon jump all the way across. No. You meant, like, somewhere you called them ports or maybe airfields <laughs> or something. You're going to do little hops across, right? Yes, um, yes. Do you know how many hops? Is, is it like, okay, take off? go land here and yeah. so, so so we planned out three different uh alternatives so okay. so like with everything we do on ingenuity we have backup plans and 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 uh there are different variables that would determine which path we take yeah um i'm wondering uh if you have handy there's in in one of the slides uh slide decks i sent towards the end there was a plot of atmospheric density ah the time. that is actually one of the images i downloaded because i thought it was super interesting um yeah. i have two density plots i've got one that shows let's see here well you just tell me if this is the right one <laughs> that's a big yes. red one is that what you want yep. yeah yeah we'll go with that cool so uh so so what this plot shows is the seasonal density variation uh throughout the year on mars 
and, and right now we're in this lull. We're in the trough of, of seasonal density. Uh, it's summertime on Mars, where we are in, 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 at Jezero Crater. Um, and that means things are very warm. And, and, when, thing, and when gases heat up, they expand. Uh, and that means your density drops. Uh, because the density is in its seasonal kind of minimum uh, over the last couple of months, uh, we've had to change how we fly ingenuity. Um, to, to account for thinner air, uh, what you do is you spin your blades faster, right? So we've bumped up our, 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 our rotor speed or our head speed from 2537 RPM. We've bumped that up to 2700 RPM. Okay. Right? That provides you with the, the that, that makes up for the lost thrust effectively, right? Um, the downside to that is you can't fly as long, right? You're spinning your blades faster. You're heating up quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're actually not constrained on our battery. We have, we have energy in the tank, so to speak, um, every sol. So we recharge every sol from our solar panel. We, ch we charge up our six lithium ion batteries, uh, and we have more than enough energy to fly longer. Uh, the reason right now we are seasonally constrained to 130 seconds is that uh, our actuators, our rotor motors are heating up and they're reaching their limits, huh. right? So because of that, going back to your question of, of how are we planning our flights out, uh, we're planning them out first based off flight time, right? So uh, if the rover, uh, if Perseverance is going to start its drive to the Delta campaign, you know, around the March timeframe, uh, or maybe a little later, we're going to start coming uh, on the upside of this curve and we'll actually be high enough where we'll get our flight time back and we can fly for 170 seconds. Okay. Um, if we start sooner, right, and if, if they continue on, on this uh, uh, fantastic, you know, pedal to the metal uh, uh, speed that they've been able to accomplish, um, we're actually going to have to start that Northwest Passage journey uh, with less flight time because we're still below that white line, our, our minimum uh, density that we've selected. Right. So, so, so a lot of exciting variables, right, and, and considerations that you, that need to come into play when when you're dealing with, you know, first off, there's two spacecraft you're trying to plan out, and, and the <laughs> schedules of the two moving spacecraft, but also just the natural physics of what's happening on on, on Mars, right? Yeah. So, uh, so in a couple of months, I, I would say in one month from today, we'll be we should be above that white line, and and we'll have our full 170 seconds back. And if that's the case. Uh, we'll do that Northwest Passage in about two, three flights. No um, kidding. If instead it's before that, if we're below that white line in terms of atmospheric density, we'll probably split it up into three or four, right? And we'll take shorter hops uh, because of the, of that lower 130 second flight time. Gotcha. Do you know what the primary driver of the density changes are? Is it like the axial tilt of Mars or, or temperatures or like the dust yeah, in I, the air? I don't know. What, what causes so, that? So I, so I believe it's just the seasonal temperature increase. Okay. Right. So so it's just summertime and in the summertime uh, things are just generally going to be warmer. And because yep. of that, the, the density is going to drop. Okay. Gotcha. This, it's something I had never thought of. Like, it's a big problem in the first place. You're going to Mars, there's barely any atmosphere. But even <laughs> the little atmosphere you have, the density changes to such an amount that it is impossible. It's critical to your helicopter. And and that's part of this mission that, you know, we didn't think we were going to have to deal with, right? No we, we, we planned for 30 days earlier in the year sure. on Mars, right? When we were on the on the left-hand side of this plot, oh. right? So we knew we'd have 25, 37 RPM in the bank. We knew that for, for 30 days, we'll be set, right? We <laughs> Tech demo was over, we went May, June, July, August, September, we started getting close to October and, and, and we knew that this was coming. We're like, all right, we need to change how we fly. We yeah. need to, you know, this is no longer the same environment anymore. We need to adapt to it. Uh, and, and that's been, I think, the, the, the beautiful aspect of, of, of this extended mission is everyone on the team being able to adapt, everyone on the team looking at Mars a little differently from soul to soul and understanding what's different today, what's different, uh, what's going to be different tomorrow. Yeah. And how can we tweak our, our, you know, constrained, limited asset on the surface to try and fit those challenges? And that, that's been a lot of fun. I, I, like, I wonder, like, I have this picture in my head about how this came to the notice of your team, right? Like, I imagine, like, a parachute engineer waltzing in one day and it's like, so, how'd y'all solve the density problem? And you're like, the density <laughs> problem? What do you, and he's like, yeah, guess what? There, you know, I, I, was that something that was identified way in advance or was the helicopter on Mars and you're like, whoa, the density's dropping? So, so it's a long series of checklists that we go through every flight, right? Um, since the beginning, right? It, 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 let me just answer your question quickly. It was not a surprise. It wasn't uh, a surprise. Okay. Uh, right, right. Uh, uh, 
we, since the beginning of the mission, we've been looking at weather forecasts gotcha. right? uh, for n not just for dust storms, you know, wind storms, um, but also density predictions. Right. Um, right now, we're looking at uh, at year long Mars year long uh, density variations. We're also interested in the per soul density variations. Right? Ah. Uh, just like here on Earth, the air is cool. Yeah, exactly. Your, your diurnal cycle. So here yep. on Earth in the morning, the air is cooler. Uh, uh, earlier in the morning, and then as the sun heats up, uh, the air throughout the day, it'll start warming up and your density will drop, right? Um, so we've been playing that game since the tech demo on a, on a small scale from day to day, but we knew that in the long term, when you zoom out from a day to day cycle and look at the seasonal cycle, this, yeah. this was coming, right? Uh, and as we approached October, we started seeing, hey, this is starting to, 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 we're starting to reach our limits. Let's get ready to try this out. And what we did, um, and, and I'm not sure if you have this uh, pulled up easily. In our commissioning phase on, on the surface, uh, which means the handful of activities about a week before we flew for the first time, uh, we baby stepped our way uh, uh, in, from our deployment. So the rover dropped us off. We released our blades. Uh, so we did a quick spin activity. We did a 50 RPM spin activity on a subsequent sol. Uh, and then finally, we did something called a high speed spin. And, and what that entailed was engineering was, was still on the surface. We never took off. We never, you know, produced any lift, but we spun our blades up to our full 25, 37 RPM for the tech demo. That, that was our last checkout before flight. So imagine this was spinning. It was spinning before and now go. it's not spinning yeah. for me. It's like it spun I, once. And I promise. Yeah, well, no. So, so the, spun, the, the spin once, that was the first step that I mentioned, the blade release. So, 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 so in the spin once activity, uh, we had little latches that were responsible for holding the rotors in place. We needed those to make sure that when we were under the belly of the rover, that the blades weren't going to start rattling and spinning on us, right? And after the rover deployed us, the rotors wouldn't start spinning uh, uh, before the rover drove off of us, right? Just because of wind gusts or whatever. Um, going back to the commissioning uh, phase, I was talking about the high-speed spin. So we did a high-speed spin in the commissioning phase to make sure that everything was working before a flight. When the seasonal density dropped on us and we wanted to change our rotor RPM target, we did the same thing. We spun the blades at full speed. We bumped up to that 2,700 RPM target. Everything checked out across the board. And at that point, we were, we were you know, ready to go for our new flight RPM for the months ahead. Um, can we talk about the exciting things that um, happen when there are those dust storms and wind storms? Because didn't <laughs> one just happen? Yes. So, so, so we just uh, went through uh, an unseasonably large dust storm uh, on Mars. So there's dust storms all the time. Uh, right. the, ma the magnitude of them picks up uh, when you get into dust storm season. And we're actually moving into, into uh, uh, there will be more dust storms and more dust in the atmosphere in general in the months ahead of us. But in January, uh, we experienced uh, a large dust storm for the first time uh, with Ingenuity. Uh, for the last you know, eight months before then, uh, we've been very fortunate that dust accumulation was not an issue for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Between flights, uh, we have shown that we were not accumulating significant amounts of dust on the solar panel. So there wasn't an issue from an energy perspective, but it was, <laughs> also wasn't an issue from a from a mechanical perspective, right? right. Um, if there's a, uh, yeah, so, so, so here's a good image where you can see, this This was our blade, our blade release activity. It's actually. both, it's dust on the solar panel and the blade release activity. So I'm, right. I'm putting them together. Right. There you go. Uh, and this dust actually, we, we believe, was from our deployment. We think that uh, uh, when we were deployed from the rover, there might have been some dust that accumulated during EDL that was deployed on the solar panel. Um, yeah. But but that has since shaken off and, and you know, definitely hasn't been an issue for us. Um, but getting back to what happened in, uh, earlier in January, we had this large dust storm. We got ready to execute Flight 19, uh, and the helicopter said no. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of pre-flight checks that the helicopter right. performs, um, just like pilots here on Earth do. Uh, yeah. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of, and and he, the, the, yeah, this plot right here uh, shows uh, the, the metrics that we we're able to record from the dust storm. Um, one of our pre-flight checks involves doing something called a blade wiggle, right? Uh, pilots on here on Earth uh, in a fixed-wing aircraft, they'll they'll check their their flaps, they'll check uh, the ailerons, the rudder. Yeah. Right and and, uh, and 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 make sure in the elevator and make sure that all your control surfaces are working. Uh, right. We do the same thing on the helicopter, but our control surfaces are actually our rotor blades. Right. right. 
Uh, and the way a, a helicopter like Ingenuity is able to move on the surface is that as the blades spin, uh, they tilt, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the periodicity, the, the how often they tilt and where in the rotation they tilt right. gives you an imbalanced torque and that allows you to lean. And, and, and that's how you lean one way and that's how you fly and then you lean another way, that's how you fly. Um, so it's very important that the mechanism that does the tilting, that does the leaning, uh, is working correctly. And, and what we use is called the swash plate. Uh, it's it's uh, it's actually very similar, Dos, probably to the swash plate on your helicopter that you have, your 3D helicopter. It's never flown. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but uh, it's a set of servos. So each rotor has three servos, uh, and it just those three servos are responsible for moving this ring up and down and tilting the ring. What happened earlier in January is we queued up the flight. We said go. We radiated the sequence, and Ingenuity woke up received its its execution commands and said, okay, this is my sequence. Uh, this is the right time. Uh, my battery is heated up. I'm ready to roll. And it started its pre-flight checkout, its wiggle of the blades. And it monitors how much current is, is being drawn, uh, and it monitors the position of its servos during its pre-flight wiggle. So it goes through this, this step of the sequence of steps of position where each of the six servos are commanded to go through. So it's going through this wiggle process and it, it noticed that as it was going through the wiggle process, the currents were too high and the position wasn't tracking. It was supposed to, uh, an engineer did exactly what it was supposed to do. It scrubbed the flight. Uh, the flight sequence canceled right, right then and there. It went back to sleep and awaited instructions, right? Uh, we got the data back down. We did some diagnostics. We retrieved some additional logs and we saw what had happened. And our theory was that, oh, uh, likely this massive dust storm that just passed us um, deposited dust and, and sand into our mechanism. We think that you know, we have sand now that we need to contend with, and the servos were trying to move and, and move the swash plate, and the sand and dust was interfering with it. Um, we looked at historical data. Uh, we, we looked at, uh, we heard from our partners at our environment who built the, the mechanism. Uh, and they did some they did some testing where they actually had a, a, a test a mock-up of the swash plate that they you know threw dust into and threw some sand into and tried some cleaning activities which meant mm -hmm. just wiggle wiggle the swash plate and keep doing it right, right. do it one time it how much did it improve two times yeah. how much did it improve three four five six seven and you see the point in which you get diminishing returns and at that point you're clean right mm -hmm. um, we looked at those results and we said all right let's give it a go. Uh, and that's exactly what we did on the surface. We sent up a series of seven uh, consecutive blade uh, wiggles, blade uh, cleaning activities. And and after the first one, you see some improvement. The second one, you saw some more. Third, fourth, fifth, and by the seventh, uh, it was it was within our range of tolerance to be acceptable for flight. Uh, so so it was it was, you know, this new experience. We hadn't had to deal with this in the last eight months. And we hadn't had to deal with a dust storm like this. Uh, but now we have a new tool in our in our in our tool belt uh, right. where we can clean ourselves out. We can actually clean the servo mechanism. We can clean the swash plate should this occur again. Uh, so so it's, it gives more confidence to the team, um, but also some important lessons learned for future uh, rotorcraft on Mars. Um, when you know when this happens, this is how you fix it. This is how you clean yourself, and this is how you get ready for another flight. Uh, and thankfully, we executed. So cool. Yeah, and then we Just executed flight 19, and everything worked out great. Yeah, that's got to be so cool to see that method actually that was tested just work exactly as you expected it to. There's no expected. feeling like it. There's no feeling like it. you you have a hypothesis. You listen to your yeah. your, your chief engineer. You listen to your partners, your, your cogies, right, and you trust them. That's that's the important part. Is we have a small team, and yeah. and we all trust everyone inherently. Uh, you know, this is this is our baby on the surface of Mars. We want to make sure that ingenuity survives as long as possible. So. Uh, without that trust, without that team that we built up over the last couple of years, I doubt I doubt it would have happened as smoothly as it did. Doss, you got some questions. <laughs> some chat questions here. There, there's so many good questions coming in from like five different streams. So I'm going to yeah. try and get a, a, a smattering of questions from all over here. Um, away. The first one, sort of a joking question, not a serious question, but also I'm actually curious, who does the customer service on your commercial off-the-shelf uh, parts when it's deployed to Mars, like, can you call somebody up and be like, so yeah, I got this uh, Snapdragon and uh, well, it's on Mars. Um, is, is there anything when you're buying commercial off the shelf stuff 
that changes because you send it to another planet? Clearly out of warranty. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 you know, when, when, when you start sending things out in space, you know, the, the, <laughs> that typically violates the user terms and, and conditions, yeah. right. With, with, with things you buy. Um, but, but, that's that's also why you want to pick your partners very closely, right? Uh, Qualcomm was one of our partners from the beginning, uh, and and their team has been with us throughout this whole process, just like Aerovironment was. Yeah. Uh, and, and whenever you know, whenever we ran into a critical problem, you pick up the phone, you get a quick answer, and team huddles together, right, and works on it. Um, there's other aspects to the design though, where it doesn't matter who you call, it doesn't matter uh, who can help you. You, you know, it ultimately falls on you, right? As a team, yep. uh, it falls on, 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 on NASA and it falls on, on, on the team here at JPL to understand, uh, even if our partners would like to help as best they can, at the end of the day, the team must make a decision and the team must move forward with, with its best estimate of, of what's going to occur. Yep. That's going to happen more likely on, uh, with a higher probability with a tech demo, right? That's going to happen uh, with, with a lot, you know, uh, more certainty. I can say uh, when you have a class D, you know, less reliable uh, aircraft like, like Ingenuity is. Um, but it all it all comes with the territory, right? High risk, high reward. Yep. And you have to be willing to take those risks and and make judgment calls when the time comes. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to lightning around a couple questions here, and I'm going to go back to the map for this one. Um, can Ingenuity be like nah? I'm not landing there. So you say, all right, I want you to do a hop and you need yep. to hop from here to here. Do you designate an exact set of coordinates where you want it to land or do you give it sort of like a landing box and it gets there and it looks down and it's like, well, that looks like a good spot in the box. Like, how do you tell it where to land and how much decision making capability does it have itself? So uh, I'll answer that in three parts. Um, first part right now, today, um, it has no authority to, to deviate from landing location. Uh, we provide a set of waypoints and, and it'll fly to the requested waypoint. Once it, it's hovering over that waypoint, it'll trigger its landing sequence. It'll start moving down to the surface. And when it gets close enough, it'll actually stop tracking features and wait for the accelerometer to tell us that the feet have hit and then it lands, right? Okay. Uh, that's how things happen today. First part of the answer. Second part of the answer is uh, I mentioned earlier uh, earlier on in the conversation that we're working on upgrades. Um, one of the potential upgrades that we're, we're extremely excited about is can we address that capability? And as a, as a, you know, last ditch effort, if we happen to miss a rock from orbit, right? That, and that's how we do everything right now is orbital imagery. If we happen to miss wow. a rock from orbit and the helicopter's coming down and, and it's able to detect something that might look like a rock, um, how much, authority are we willing to give the helicopter in terms of deviating from that? So that's something that we are actively looking into okay. and, 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 and excited to start developing for uplink and upgrade on the helicopter in the months ahead. The third part to that answer is what will future helicopters do, right? I haven't mentioned uh, this yet. Uh, I don't think we've, we've touched on, on future generations, yeah. but um, you know, we've been busy uh, uh, trying to answer the question what could come next, right? For the last three and a half years, we've had a research effort called Mars Science Helicopter that's trying to answer the question, if we could send a larger platform uh, to Mars, right? And, and if we could, you know, get a bus in the sky on Mars, what would the scientists be excited to do? And what could that bus in the sky on Mars actually do, right? Where, where, where does the engineering bring us from today's technology? And where do we need to get it to, to be able to do the kinds of things that scientists are excited about. Yeah. Uh, and one of those things that, that we've determined in, in the last three years of developing uh, this concept called Mars Science Helicopter uh, is, is that we would want the ability to uh, better be able to detect these landing locations and be able to detect hazards, but also actually be able to, to you know, pick its own landing locations from high above, right? Not necessarily uh, just as we're coming in terminally for descent, but be able mm -hmm. to select its own landing location and say, hey, fly in that general direction. And on your way, find a landing site that, you know, the helicopter, that MSH, Mars Science Helicopter, finds appropriate and go ahead and land there, right? Uh, that is that is where we want to go. That is the future, is being able to hand off that autonomy. And, and I think autonomy is key when, when thinking about uh, robotics and space in the future is, is really letting go of the controls and, yeah. and putting the trust in the algorithms. That, yeah. That's coming. 
Makes sense. And that's a, like, it, I knew that we had the slide in here that I could jump to. This is the Mars science helicopter, but these are just sort of like ideas. There's like yeah. a hexacopter Mar it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so Mars science helicopter, it's, it's just a, a research concept right. to, to try and understand what is possible. And, yeah, and yeah. the, the, the most capable version of it uh, is what you see here is this hexacopter. Gotcha. Uh, so it, it's about the size of the rover itself. It would be about the size of Perseverance. Yep. Six rotors, um, approximately the same diameter as Ingenuity's. Um, but the main claim to fame of, of of this design is that it could carry science payloads in the two to five kilogram range. Gotcha. Right? Whereas right now Ingenuity has no payload. Technically, it has you know the color camera, which is you know a gram or so. Um, we want to carry two to five kilograms of science payload and bring that to the frontiers on Mars. That 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 is the dream. And, and really the whole point of ingenuity is we've shown that we can, yes, we can fly on Mars. So what now, what are you going to do with that? that right. Yeah. Uh, we're, we, we, we are that foundation that a, not only proved that you can, but the part that people don't realize sometimes is we're collecting a treasure trove of engineering data with every single flight. And that engineering data is going to get collected and is, is already collected. And we hope to make this, you know, the foundation for future generations say, here, take this data set, use this and build something better. Gotcha. I gotta say, I love that somebody labeled this uh, artist concept with the <laughs> Apollo astronauts standing next to the hexacopter on Mars. Hey, you, need, you need to be explicit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Um, good deal. <laughs> um, I, can I get some more questions here? I mean, we always run yeah. out of time. We have like 18 minutes left, 17 now. Um, I'm going to try to get as many questions as I can. Fire away, rapid fire. Yeah, chat, thank you all so much for watching this, and I appreciate all the questions. I'm going to try to get as many as I can. Um, this is a interesting question. Who decides when you can fly on Mars? Do you need like FAA approval or something, or do you just you 100% decide when you're flying or not? And follow-up, uh -huh. are there any planetary protection considerations about when you fly, where you fly, that sort of thing. Sure. So, and I'm going to go rapid fire here. Sure. Uh, in terms of when we fly, um, that's the 2020 team, right? So, so, so we're part of the 2020 team and we work uh, with the 2020 team to schedule helicopter activities and try and fit them in along with the bevy of other, you know, science critical activities they're doing every single salt. Yep. So, so it's a negotiation. We say, Hey, can we fly on this salt? No, this salt is difficult. We're doing sampling, ah. we're doing remote science. Right. And, and, and we work with them and we say, all right, you tell us when's a good time. We'll try and, we'll try and work that on our team. And then we work on the sequences, hand them off. And then, and then, you know, it's been working great that, that, that that's how scheduling happens on Mars. If you will, there is no uh, FAA we need to file flight plans with. It's really uh, the 2020 team as a whole. Gotcha. Uh, and then the second question, uh, remind me. Oh, geez. Planetary remind protection. Me. Oh, yeah. Planetary, planetary protection. protection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so there's the pre-launch planetary protection aspect, which, you know, everything we send to Mars has to go through planetary protection, you know, process to make sure that everything's clean and sterile and, and, you know, spore counts are below certain levels. Yep. Um, when it comes to how does that define our flight plans? Uh, you know, if there were areas of interest fr from a planetary protection standpoint, uh, that that were identified around us. We, yeah, we are definitely we would avoid them because we don't want to crash the helicopter. Right. That. Um, you know, God forbid. You know, that is our our last flight. We would like that to not be somewhere where the rover was planning on taking a sample. Right. We don't want to get bits of carbon fiber in the in the sample tube. Let's not do that. Right. We've so, we discovered carbon fiber on Mars. Like, yeah, okay, you drill through the rotor. Right. Right. So 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 we would you know. We're, we're announcing our flight plans, obviously, you know, a week in advance of, of ever uplinking. Uh, and if it hasn't been a problem in the last, you know, eight, nine months. Yeah. Um, but if we come near some biologically sensitive areas, you know, science is king. Uh, yep. Whatever, you know, if science dictates that this area is off limits, that's just how it is. Okay. Gotcha. Um, how much data storage capacity does Ingenuity have? Is it recording its video locally and then uplinking it later? Or is it sending real-time video to the rover and then the rover stores and uploads? Okay, so first off, you said video. We don't do video. Okay. Uh, we do we do images. Okay. Uh, and and uh, it's uh, it is stored locally. Um, so so we have. Uh, I need to double check the RAM and flash statistics. I can pull it up here on the side. Um, it, for, for for those of you playing along at home, you can uh, Google the original Snapdragon uh, flight board uh, with the 801 processor on there, and I think it was something on the order of four to eight gigabytes. Okay. Of storage that we have. Um, it's either that or 32. I forget which variant we have. I need to double check that that metric. But gotcha. it is all stored locally. Uh, uh, we send back 
health critical telemetry while we're flying. Mm -hmm. And then once we come back down and land, that's when we shoot things across. And, and sometimes, depending on how much time the schedule allows after a flight, we'll send the telemetry back right after. Or we'll hold on to it on our file system. We'll power down, wake up on a subsequent soul, and then send everything back. Then send it over. Gotcha. What's the, what's the bandwidth between the rover and the helicopter? Is it like... DSL, cable modem, fiber, like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I guess if we were to compare it to to, to, to ISP uh, uh, metrics. So I mean, it we are not uh, we don't we don't have gigabit if if that's what you're asking. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're 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 closer towards you know DSL era. Um, we have two different. Uh, we have a 900 megahertz COTS radio. Okay, so so uh, you could think of it comparable to, to to like a Zigbee 900 megahertz radio link. Um, and we have different modulation schemes. We if we were trying to prioritize range or throughput. And that changes how much data we can get across. Ah. Also, depending on how much uh, attenuation we're getting from the surface of Mars, or if there's obstructions or rocks, you know, that'll change uh, the effective throughput. Um, so, so yeah, you can think of it like a DSL uh, uh, quality connection, uh, more than enough for what we need. And you know, when we're when we're trying to send across 13, uh, you know, or 10 JPEGs of 13 megapixel quality right. uh, per flight, uh, it, it serves us very well. So it's not like a 14.4 modem where you see the image loading on the rover. No, no. You never get to that level. <laughs> nice. No. Does anybody even know what a 14.4 modem is? Anyways, um, <laughs> let's but see. But I'm starting to think. I'm starting to think that the rover and Ingenuity have a better connection than I do here in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's let's... like one percent of the people here can have broadband. Everything else cannot be considered broadband. According to the um, we've talked a little bit about the plans for the future, Helis. Bigger, like what's next? And it sounds like bigger payloads is is the thing that you're looking for. Some of these, Teddy, I'm just going to sort of say, okay, we talked about that a little bit, but I don't want to yeah, ignore yeah. the question. Nope. Um, do Are there any plans for the helicopter to approach the rover again? And if you do that, is there any courtesy i guess etiquette there is it the helicopter lands and then the rover drives to it or the helicopter flies and lands near the rover <laughs> so, so, so there's that? no right so there's no there's no uh there's no plans and there's no point in ever approaching the rover in fact we we don't want to get close to the rover we have about a, it's about a 50 meter keep out zone right uh where the heli shall never go anywhere closer than 50 meters of the rover um in their dry plans currently for this week, actually they're going to be coming pretty close uh, and 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 passing where Ingenuity is. Right. Um, but but yeah, there is n there's no reason why Ingenuity should ever be getting close to the rover in the future. Um, uh, our our objective is to stay as far ahead as possible to scout out, send back the scout images, and keep doing it. Gotcha. So it's not like the the camera on Ingenuity could be useful to take pictures of the rover to see damage or wear and tear or something like that. That's no. not a plan right now. No, no, no. The rover has very capable cameras on its arm that that, that can be used for that, and it does not need Ingenuity's photos. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> no. It's a, it's a really good question though. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I know yeah. the answer to this one. Uh, <laughs> If Ingenuity were to tip over, could the rover come over and fix it and upright it? But I have a Again, feeling we would never do that. You wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. Yes, if if uh, if we have a rough landing and we're tipped over, that first off, if that were to happen during a flight activity, yep, uh, chances are the rotor system would be damaged. There's no benefit to to, to rewriting uh, Ingenuity, uh, but also we would never do that. Um, yeah, the Perseverance needs to keep on its core mission. Uh, which is to get samples, yep. collect those samples, get them ready, and and we wouldn't dedicate souls to doing something like that. It's it's not a helicopter maintenance bot that we put on Mars. It's a science exactly. robot, like a science yeah, we, we, yeah. Ingenuity is there to serve perseverance, not the other way around. Gotcha, <laughs> makes sense. And is, is there a big possibility? And y'all, I'm I'm mixing all sorts of questions together. I'm trying to get them as many as I can. Is there any possibility that the thin Martian wind could blow Ingenuity over, or is it just so thin it can't do that? Yeah, it's it's really more the latter. Uh, uh, Hollywood tends to blow uh, that out of proportion. If you're to watch uh, some Martian movies um, <laughs> and what dust storms could be like on Mars, yep. uh, at the end of the day, it's one percent Earth's density. So th there's not a lot of matter. There's not a lot of uh, actual molecules hitting you to, to to be able to you know knock you over. That's why we need to spin so fast to stand any sort of chance of producing lift. So so uh, that was looked at in the beginning of the design. That was margin for. Uh, we're not concerned about that. Gotcha. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> materials. We talked about commercial off the shelf. You weren't trying to re reinvent the wheel or anything, but what are the primary materials engineering is made of? Aluminum, carbon fiber? Carbon fiber is is, is a lot of it. So, so our, our central mass is carbon fiber. Our blades are uh, they're a foam core and then carbon fiber wrap on top of that. Our solar panels, carbon fiber uh, uh, base or yeah. substrate where our solar cells are laid on top of. Our feet are carbon fiber. 
you know, we're using carbon fiber for a reason. It's very strong. It's very light. Um, inside the, the the body, inside of our electronics, right? We have we have some metal components that hold that structure together, uh, and then we have our four sided PCB around that. Yeah. Uh, and then our six lithium ion batteries are inside that cube. Uh, but but in general, uh, the the vast majority of the structure of Ingenuity is carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. Gotcha. Um, another question in summer. I'm like <laughs> speed running questions no, no. here. Jump right no. in um, if no. you have anything. It looks a little awkward to have the solar panel on top of the rotor. So did were there any other designs that were considered, like rotors made of solar panels or solar panels on the landing legs? Or was it just not a big enough consideration to have that big flat solar panel on top? Um, right. So so if you're referring to the effects that that panel has on the entrained air yeah. in, 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 into, into the rotor system, um, th that aerodynamic problem was looked at, right? Uh, the problem is anywhere else that you would consider, like on the side walls of the ECM, the, the core module, the electronics, the electronics core module, yeah. um, the blades itself, that would be challenging to do for electrical reasons. Uh, but any other surface has either you're, you're not getting enough energy in per soul to keep yourself alive uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or your mass issues would, would, over, would outweigh any benefits that, that you would get by doing that. Um, and we just knew that it wasn't presenting a controls issue aerodynamically by having it above. So it was the it was the the best option overall. Gotcha. This is, again, good questions here. Speed yeah, yeah. Um Here's one, and I, I don't know if this is the sort that you would normally answer or would be able to release. But what's the average age of team members on the helicopter team? Because it's like drones and you know FPV racing and this sort of thing. Is it a younger team or is it a mix? I would say it's a mix, right? Uh, you know. Uh, I don't know, if, you know, I can't, I don't think I can go into, you know, details sure, on, sure. on people's personal information, but, yep. but, you know, we have, a, we have a mix of, of seasoned veterans that have gone through, you know, uh, dozens of flight projects. And then, and then we have uh, people like myself, this is my first flight project. Uh, and, and there's, you know, handfuls of other people that, that, you know, it's their first flight project experience as well. Uh, and, you know, th that, that I think is part of the exciting part of a, of a, of a technology demonstrator is that you're doing high risk, high reward things. And, and also, you're bringing in people that are, are trying this out for the first time, you know, bringing in that new generation yep. uh, to train them up. Yeah. Transferring some experience there. I, I, exactly. Some, some knowledge. Hit us with an acronym. Earlier you said one that I didn't know when you were talking about the original the original landing zone. It was like the did OEB or something? Octavia E. Butler landing site. Uh, yes, exactly. There you go. So when you said yep. OEB, that stood for Octavia yep. E. Butler. Um, you also said something earlier that caught my eye. What an acronym, but you said radiate the command. Is that yes. just a cool way to say you sent the command? Yeah, it's a cool way to say it. I I, I, I was confused by that the first time I heard it. My ears perked. I'm like, what did what, what did they just say? You know, we're, we're on station. We're, we have our headsets. We're all working from home, right? And and I heard, all right, we're getting ready to radiate. And I was like, that sounds cool. I want to use that cool. term in the future. <laughs> <laughs> in, any other uh, acronyms or shortcuts or things that you use that's sort of specific to this? Oh, there's dozens. Too many to go through. Uh, uh, NASA likes its acronyms, and 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 JPL is no exception. Yep. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, and you know, MHTD, Mars Helicopter Technology Demonstrator, that that was our moniker for, for the longest period of time, and then uh, we were happily, you know, given our official name, Ingenuity. Uh, so we've we've been rolling with Ingenuity since then. Is no shortcut could names say, like go go ahead, Summer. I was just gonna say, could you say a sentence that we would be least likely to understand? <laughs> Based on like your team's, uh, you know, shorthand and and acronyms and all that stuff. <laughs> on the yeah. spot. <laughs> yeah yeah okay um uh I, I feel like i can't say anything without the you know if, if people on the team hear this they're gonna be rolling their eyes and saying what what sort of crazy stuff is teddy saying here uh, <laughs> so yeah within our ecm our, our ncb carries the sdb which you know runs our fsw and we want to make sure that that's working you know uh, uh well from soul to soul so you know our our, our uplink tomorrow uh needs to go smoothly uh, and make sure that, uh, you, well, you mentioned earlier five by five, that's something that we use often, a lot nice. of other, uh, uh, kind of quick, uh, quick shortcuts there, but, but I think that's enough. <laughs> I think that that's enough for today in terms of uh, jargon. I, I think that's enough. I, right there at the beginning, I was like, this guy sounds like he works for NASA. So <laughs> well done. Um, let's see again, running through as many questions as we can. Oh, what programming languages are used to program the helicopter? Great question. So, so. Uh, for a lot of our tools here on the ground, we use a lot of Python, right? Uh, in terms of the actual flight software, 
uh, the, the mainstay uh, uh, at JPL uh, and for a lot of flight projects is C, C++. Um, that is still, you know, uh, the, the, at the top of the charts in terms of popularity for a lot of good reasons. Uh, in terms of inspection or introspection, being able to understand it, what's happening underneath the hood and performance reasons. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, C, C++, uh, and a lot of Python in terms of tool development, ground data systems, things like that. Good deal. Is it like your own scripting language that, that was developed for sending the commands? Like here's the, oh, the format yeah, of the command file? Yes, the, there's there's tomes and tomes of uh, of, of instructions and, and uh, tools, custom tools that, that JPL has built up over the decades uh, to check and triple check and 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 find problems and predict when problems are going to occur uh, yes there's a specific scripting language we use uh, it's called rover markup language yeah uh, and that, that that that's what that's how we start our uh, our activities and then it feeds into the sequences which kick off binaries that run in that C binaries that run on the helicopter gotcha so you start with the RML and then you go into the binaries and tell me rover markup language is RML yep Yes. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Again, y'all trying to get as many questions. Teddy, this is fantastic. Like, this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for the time here. Happy to, happy to. Uh, excited um, to, to share the excitement. Hopefully, everyone listening at home is uh, rooting on for, for ingenuity. Yep, we talked about materials. We talked. Oh, we looked at this. Let's look at this real quick, Teddy, because uh, you brought this to my attention about some community, I guess, imagery that was generated from pictures taken from the yeah, helicopter. Yeah, yeah. So, Let's close so, with that real quick. Sure. So, so the, this this will give everyone a, a sense for you know wh why why do you want aircraft on Mars, right? Yep. Um, we're looking at orbital imagery right now, which is great from from a strategic planning perspective. And the rover takes a ma like these massive, in terms of bits, uh, beautiful high resolution imagery of of samples and rocks. Uh, in between is is the gap that aircraft on Mars is trying to fill. Uh, mm -hmm. And right now we're, we're zoomed in on on where we actually flew Flight 13. Uh, it's this little yellow rectangular area at the on the left hand side of the image. Uh, and the goal of Flight 13, there was this specific rock outcrop that the scientists identified. Um, and what we did is, is we designed up this flight where we flew up to the outcrop, we flew along it, and captured a bunch of color images pointing into the outcrop. Uh, the point of that is to get those images down here on Earth, uh, and you stitch together those color images to form a three-dimensional map. And what that map gives you is this amazingly new and detailed perspective that you wouldn't have had it otherwise. Uh, if you want to pull up the, the three-dimensional map, these are all online. Uh, one website, for example, is here on Sketchfab. Yep. Um, and you can uh, zoom in and and pan around, uh, zoom in, change the the the, the perspective, and produce these these easily accessible right to the science community, to the rover planning community, uh, and to everyone at home here. Three-dimensional maps where you can explore and try and identify and say, oh, this rock in particular looks interesting, or this outcrop over here looks interesting. Let's identify this for further investigation by, by, perse uh, by perseverance, right? Yeah. Uh, this, you know, if, if there's one thing, you know, people can take home, it's, it's this aerial dimension, this aerial perspective that ingenuity brings to the table on Mars. Uh, and future rotorcraft will, will produce a lot more, uh, you know, more capable, higher resolution, but, but, but this kind of dimension is what we're looking for. Yeah, I, I got to like explain a little bit more here. This, these are photos. This, this is actual photos. This isn't like, or I guess they're photos that are laid onto a 3D rendering of the landscape, but they are exactly. real photos. It's not exactly. somebody's. So, so, exactly. So so you can, uh, anyone can look up these photos. There, there's a, uh, a raw image website where all of Ingenuity's and all of Perseverance's photos are, are available yep. and out on the internet. Uh, and you can look at our Flight 13 photos and you can match up which uh, how the, those photos were used to stitch together and generate these, this three-dimensional map. What happens is each photo is tied to a location and a time during the helicopter's flight. Yep. So the helicopter says, I'm here, I'm going to take this photo, translates to the side and says, I'm here, I'm going to take this photo, I'm here, I'm going to take this photo. If you know the position where each one of these photos was taken, you now know the perspective that each one of the photos is providing. And you can use you know, matched up uh, uh, features, right? You can say this rock is the same as this rock but from a different perspective to generate that three-dimensional view. Right, and that's what we're looking at here. Is are are all of those 
uh, uh, RTE images, the return to earth yep. color images stitched together to generate this, this three dimensional surface. That's God. And I, I got to point this out really quickly. Like, like imagine you're the Rover, right? Not the helicopter, but the Rover And the Rover's like do to do to do driving down through here. And there's a Rover driver somewhere saying we would never drive that. This guy's an idiot, whatever. Just imagine <laughs> um, Rover has great cameras on it. Right. And the Rover's like looking up at these rocks and it's like, okay, the Rover can see the rocks, but check this out. If you want to see the other side of the rocks, you've got to get a camera over there. And for the rover to go da, 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 up the hill, whatever, around the corner, it's not something the not rover would do, right? Yeah, and, and, and that, that, that's, that's the value that we're trying to provide to the Perseverance team, right? Yep. We want to be that, that aerial asset where they can say, hey, heli team, um, at the River Delta, there's going to be different paths we can take. We don't know which one we want to do yet based off orbital imagery, can you give us a perspective around the corner? Fly yep. down there, fly down that corridor, give us some imagery, let's generate these 3D maps, and let's plan, right? That is our goal, that is our dream. That's that's very cool. Like that's I didn't really realize that, but the mobility of the helicopter, its ability to go places that are more difficult for the rover to get to, and the ability to take pictures of the other side of rocks. Right, right. <laughs> not, not the same science pictures that the rover has on the really nice cameras, but navigational, like like information, tactical stuff. Uh, the helicopter excels at that. It's something we've never had before. So yep. I, it's seven oh two. We always run out of time. Well, something we'd love to have in astronomy. Could would love to see the galaxy from the other side. There That'd you go. <laughs> We just, um, gotta, we just gotta figure out a way to get there quickly to provide that alternate image. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, FDL drives coming down the road. <laughs> that is going to bring us to the end of our show today. Teddy, you've been here for more than an hour and a half. Um, of course, Teddy is the team lead for the Ingenuity helicopter team, the helicopter that's flying around on Mars. You've taken so much time out of your evening and days before this when we did tech checks and stuff like that. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. This is this is My fantastic. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And Thank also... You. To the whole team. Yep. Oh, that, that's true. Yeah. It's not just one person flying the uh, no, helicopter over no, there. No. It's an entire we, team we, of we, people. We, it's the whole team. Couldn't do it without the team. And then, like I said, it's that small, tight-knit team that we got that, that got us this far. And, yep. and we'll continue to keep pushing the limits in the months ahead. Yep. Absolutely. And then also, folks, with me over oh, this side today, uh, Summer Ash. Summer is our, our moderator who helps us through some of the discussion. Summer, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Oh, I will talk about Mars forever. Yeah. Gosh. All right, folks, as you do, like I said, coming up to the end of the show, but put some feedback back in the comments if you like this sort of show. Um, if you don't, I'm just going to delete your comment, and I'll just pass on the nice comments to Teddy. But uh, it was absolutely the like, technical detail we got. Teddy, you're a fantastic speaker, just interested the entire time. Somebody in chat said, I've never seen chat so quiet because everybody just wants to hear him talk. Because sometimes there's nothing to talk about. We're like watching a stainless steel tank in South Texas for 18 hours straight. Um, and here, everybody was just... I think it wrapped listening to what you were saying. So uh, thank you so much. Love this kind of coverage. Great interview. Enjoyed the details, the technical details. Bonkers fantastic show today. I guess that's good, right? <laughs> It's pretty good. That should be the show title. We'll take, we'll take it. it. <laughs> we'll take it. Love this great show. That was amazing. Absolutely love it. Um, folks, wherever you are watching, whether you are on uh, twitch.tv slash Intrepid Museum, the Intrepid's YouTube channel, you're watching on Facebook, you're over with the NASA Space Flight crew watching on NASA Space Flight, my Twitch channel, wherever you were, I was trying to bring all your questions in today. Please don't send me mean messages that I missed your question. I tried really hard to get as many as I could. Um, but that is going to bring us to the end of today's Virtual Astronomy Live. Be on the look for look out for us next month. We are going to be changing dates and times coming up here. Look for some announcements on that. But we hope to make these sorts of in-depth interviews a regular thing on all the channels. So we appreciate everybody hanging out with us. Teddy, Summer, thank you again so much for the time. And we will see you nerds later. Thanks for watching, y'all. Oh, oh no, I have a new screen I'm supposed to show at the end. Time out, sorry. It looks like this. <laughs> yeah, all right, bye. Details, details. <laughs>